Hey everybody, welcome to the Mormon History Hoedown with me. I am your host, Kara Burrell. Sometimes I go by Nuanso, and sometimes I bring in some of my absolute favorite people to talk to about all of these things that we deal with when we are deconstructing religion. So welcome to the podcast, my very special friend, Britt Hartley. Hello. I am so honored for you to join us after your killer speech at Thrive, where uh, crowds of ex-Mormons heard you speak on depatriarchying our spirituality. Tears were flowing. <laughs> my heart was bursting. And um, just thank you so much, Britt, for what you offer to this like post-deconstruction space and being so vulnerable and sharing so much of some of the dark spaces that you've been through and helping so many people. Thank right you back at you. I, I love tears too. Okay. You're the best. So <laughs> if people are not familiar with you, um, they maybe have not come across your gigantically popular TikTok channel, No Nonsense Spirituality. Maybe they didn't see your amazing Mormon stories interview already. Um, but what should people know about you, Britt? So what I work you know? now. Yeah. My name is Britt Hartley. I live in Boise, Idaho, which is Salt Lake City's little sister up here. And I deconstructed from Mormonism now about 13 years ago. So I've been kind of hanging out in the deconstruction space for a long time now. And I currently work as an atheist spiritual director where I help people try to find spiritual tools that just make life more meaningful and just better to live without having to believe the unbelievable is kind of my approach to spirituality. Beautiful. So right off the bat, I know that people are going to go, huh, atheist, spiritual leader, director, um, and we will kind of get into a lot of that. But I wanted to start with just the basics of when you kind of deconstruct too hard or the realizations that come up. I titled this like 10 realizations of leaving the religion, uh, the terror, the nihilism, the freedom, a lot of the things in the first half of life that you kind of build up. And then in the second half of life, kind of have to come into your own on. And I know you offer a lot of great tools and, you know, spiritual direction in a secular way um, that have helped me a ton. And you speak a language that I didn't know, you know, really was spoken out there. So I'm ex really excited to get into a lot of more of like the tools and the, the helpful things. But if you want to start with the beginning. Um, you do kind of this coaching with people and clients who are sometimes in, I guess you call it like the void or this nihilistic phase or um, just have have deconstructed a little bit too hard. So when you first, um, you know, are talking to clients or just people in this ex Mormon space on TikTok, Christianity, what to you do you feel like is the biggest question, problem, issue that you're the most passionate about helping people realize, talk through, understand? Yeah. So when I started doing this work, I was doing Mormon deconstruction as my kind of bread and butter of of what I was doing. And, you know, I like you, I dug into the history and I could help people kind of make sense of polygamy or whatever they were working through with their Mormon deconstruction. But then for me personally and for other people, I was finding that there was a subsection of people who deconstruct religion who keep on deconstructing. And so that uh, wrecking ball that kind of was taking out Mormonism was starting to take out religion in general and God and sense of self and free will. And what are we doing here? And what is the purpose of all this? And this is a matrix and um, kind of just kept going until that wrecking ball takes everything. And you're just kind of what we call in the void where you don't have any psychological or social anchors left. And you're just kind of floating out in space. And I experienced that as part of my continuing deconstruction after deconstructing Mormonism. And then as I was talking to others, I realized, oh, there were other people who, not everyone, some people, some people deconstruct Mormonism and they had enough structure still, or they just kind of enjoyed their life enough that literally they had their cup of coffee and they were off and running. Um, but I noticed that for me and for others, that there were people that 
were not thriving outside of Mormonism mm -hmm. because they were really struggling. And so I started to talk more and more about that. And so now my work is almost exclusively nihilism recovery. And it's it's really what I talk about the most because there are so many resources for Mormon deconstruction, Christianity deconstruction. That seems to be, you can have a lot of resources. There's a lot of podcasts. There's a lot of coaches. I feel like half of ex-Mormons were all deconstruction coaches because we did the work and we, we, you know, we found the terms and we want to help others and all of that. Um, but now I, I focus more on the people, the subsection of people who kept going and are kind of stuck in a place where we call the void or nihilism, where you've lost every psychological anchor and you don't know up from down or left from right anymore. And you can get stuck in that place without tools. Has anyone ever interviewed you and started crying in the first five minutes? <laughs> Um, a new one. So what came up for you? I'm curious. Well, um, I'm a silly gal started as a comedian. I love history. And, uh, when I started working at Morbid stories, um, I went straight from kind of like, you know, making silly TikToks, deconstructing things, satirizing the church and jumping into kind of the trauma of, you know, people telling their stories. And, um, now that I have my own like nonprofit, my own, uh, you know, space that I'm trying to set up here and be sustainable in. Um, my heart is really in that space. That's what I tap into. That's what I remember the most from my time at Mormon Stories. That's what I remember the most from my personal deconstruction is a lot of that darkness. And um, like literally, you know, I know that you have your, you uh, had a podcast for a couple of years with Bill Real. And like, sometimes when I just say Bill Real's name, like it's like synonymous with like how I used to feel about like Jesus Christ or something or just like somebody who helped put together pieces in, in that messiness of, uh, you know, speaking a language that there's a way out. And so again, like I started this podcast, just, it's really unique to find people who don't just want to talk about, you know, like I say, hitting Joseph Smith in the balls or whatever. <laughs> it's like, yeah. What happens and it's next? like, all of that is fun. And all of like all the satire that you do, like you're, you are the best at it. And it's hilarious and how we are as an ex-Mormon community. You had one the mm -hmm. other day about like, we're so unique in wanting to do this with our marriage or do this with our sexuality. And it's like, we're being so typical. Um, and you just really nail the satire on both sides kind of, or on all sides of the Mormon spectrum. And, and also, although that world is very fun and all that, although that world can be just really great especially when you get ex-Mormons together where we can laugh and have some loud, irreverent laughter about our experience. Um, there is also probably times in your deconstruction where you wanted to die, where you yeah. didn't see a really a reason to get up and play human and deal with this amount of suffering. And there wasn't a point. And I think that there is space for both of those conversations. Yeah. So I'm glad that you're modeling that. We work well together, Brett. We work well together. And yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I made a joke about how Utahns uh, practicing non-monogamy, just like the first of a generation. Yeah. Like Mormon and ex-Mormon. <laughs> like radical. <laughs> yeah. We're really ahead of our time here. We are yeah. pushing the boundaries. <laughs> One state is going to lead the way. It's going to be Utah. <laughs> right. So uh, let's start with, I'm, I'm curious First of all, um, nihilism is something that I didn't know there was like kind of a word for until I hit it and it kind of smacks you in the face. Um, I think for a lot of people, their deconstruction out of religion is like, you know, whether it's like this doesn't feel true or these rules seem arbitrary or this doesn't add up logically or, you know, whether you're Mormon, Christian, all kinds of deconstruction, you're like, this just doesn't, doesn't logically make sense to me anymore. And I always just say it's like, well, it's a not true thing. For me, it's a not true thing anymore. Um, and and then you don't really um, know where else to go. So what for you do you think are for some of like, I want to get into nihilism in a sec, but right off the bat, what realizations have you come to um, that you think would be helpful to share for people that are like kind of the pitfalls right after they kind of come to that conclusion that this is a not true thing over here? What are some of the pitfalls that you think deconstructing folks kind of fall into? 
Mm, yeah, that's a good question. So first of all, if we're defining nihilism, it's just an ism. It's, it's, it's a belief that there is no inherent meaning in the universe. And some people experience that as very positive. So for example, David Bakavoy really didn't resonate with my podcast, right? Um, I think Alan Mount might be similar. So, so nihilism is not inherently scary or bad that there's no inherent meaning of the universe. Some people really intuitively just say, well, then I'll create my own meaning and my life is great and I love my life. And they move right into that. And nihilism is a positive thing. So nihilism can be positive or negative based on your experience. It's not uh, always a negative thing. So for David Bakavoy, learning that there was no inherent meaning in the in the universe was inherently positive for him, that he could create his own meaning. And he lives now, he self-identifies as a uh, optimistic nihilist, and he's thriving in that space. For me, that wasn't an intuitive move. For me, um, and, and this may be more a, a, person, a personality thing, but if you tend towards introversion, if you tend towards neuroticism, if you tend towards, um, if you just suffer in your life in general more, if you suffer with depression, uh, it can be harder to just say, well, I'm just going to create my own meaning and life is going to be great. That can be not an intuitive shift. And so one of the things where people get stuck is there's all of these paths of what you can do with your life and what you, how you, how you should be spending your time and how you can create meaning. Um, and it can feel overwhelming when there's too much chaos and you will feel paralyzed. So when you're in something like Mormonism, a high, a high demand fundamentalist religion, there's too much order and you'll feel suffocated, right? You want to break out of this box. But if you swing to the very opposite where there's too much chaos, I don't even know truth anymore. I don't even know if we're interacting with truth. I don't know what I should do. I don't know what more, how I can have morality. I literally don't know up from down anymore. That's too much chaos. And when we get too much yeah. chaos, we become paralyzed. We literally can't get out of bed because there's no, there's no way to make a decision when you're paralyzed. There's no way to make a decision when you have no structure at all. Mm -hmm. And so I see people get really stuck in this space. And then, and then uh, if you've been burned by religion, you have something extra. So people, uh, especially Gen Z, can come on to nihilism uh, all kinds of ways. There are many paths to that space, either philosophically or breakdowns of institutions. But religious people or post-religious people have an extra thing to deal with, which is they have this wound where they used to believe something that wasn't true. And they know mm -hmm. that they can get sucked into yeah, a between. cult or beliefs that aren't real. And they're afraid of having to go through another faith crisis. And so the problem that happens is not only are you paralyzed, but there's tools all around you. Yeah. But because you are so skeptical and you've been so burned, it's like all those tools have poison on them and you can't pick them up. And that's when you get really, really stuck where it's like, you can't even make a decision, like the simplest decision you can't even make anymore. And so when mm -hmm. you're in that space, you really have to go from you out. And this is the shift that's hard for the Mormon brain. If you were raised in Mormonism, you were raised with this idea that there's this story, here's the overarching narrative, Here, here's the story, uh, the grand narrative of the universe. And because of this story, this is how you should pattern your life. And so even though the beliefs have shifted and you don't believe that story anymore, your brain still has that thought pattern. And this is what's really tricky. Your brain still has the thought pattern of, I'm going to find the truth so that I can know how to pattern my life. And then mm -hmm. you go out looking and you realize, I don't even know if we are interacting with ultimate reality at all. Maybe there's you know, no truth that we can really put a stamp on. And then your brain doesn't really know what to do except shut down. That's the only pattern it knows. And so the big shift in that space is, can you do meaning a different way instead of a story or a truth? and then going down to you, can you go from you out? And that's right. and that can be helpful because you don't choose your core values. You don't choose what resonates with you. You don't really choose even how you enjoy to play and your preferences. 
some things just resonate in your body and some things don't. Some things feel really natural and intuitive and some voices resonate in your body and some don't. So because, because of that, we can actually use that as an anchor to take our first steps forward. That for whatever reason, this meat suit with electricity in my brain, whatever this thing is that I, we call Brittany, really likes conversations like this. I'll be buzzing mm -hmm. the rest of the day because we got to, to hang out today, right? Mm -hmm. And doesn't like, you know, watching the Kardashians or whatever, Some, something else that just doesn't resonate with me. And once we start there, that actually there are things that are just inherently meaningful to me. Now I can be more intentional about what are the what are the ways that I enjoy playing? What are the ways that I enjoy living? How do I experience being? What are the sandcastles that are so fun to build? It doesn't matter to me that a wave is gonna come and knock it down. And when we start moving in that direction, we can actually find some anchors and our first steps out of nihilism. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful, amazing kind of summary of a lot of the journey and stuff. But so much of us, I, I can speak for myself. I know that you've spoken to this before as well, where you, you go through these kinds of, uh, you know, meaningless phases and this chaos and stuff. And you're so happy that you are, you know, out of this high demand religion. And there's, you know, there's coping mechanisms, there's numbing things, there's plenty of places that you could go that, you know, that weren't open to you before, but ultimately coming into a sense of like what you value, what you actually feel the most in tune with practicing to not just numb things, but yeah, create a new life for yourself outside of this place that isn't just like, I'm happy because I'm an ex-Mormon. It's like, I'm happy mm. because I've built something. And that is just like another lane of a highway that is in my past that I am building something else over here. And um, it's, it's a space that I wish we talked about almost like constantly in this ex Mormon space because it's it um it can come with some of the you know the we're gonna do a little bit of a trigger warning here in the first few minutes as well because I think we're gonna get into a lot of darker subjects about you know unaliving and where the kind of hopelessness and meaninglessness can take people but I say all that just to be like it's I want to be very honest that like I have really confronted a lot of dark thoughts since the, in the four years leaving the church that I didn't confront when I was Mormon. And when you speak with people, do you find that's pretty common as well? That the darkest times of wanting to out alive or something, they happen as a post-Mormon, not as a Mormon sometimes. I totally agree. And it kind of sneaks up on you because when you're doing the truth game and you're binging the RFM, John DeLynn, Bill Real podcast, trying to get Nuance a sense Ho of our podcast. history. Nuance Ho podcast. Uh, Depatriarch <laughs> your podcasting list. Yes, <laughs> no, that's true. That's true. It's almost like a rite of passage, though. You know, like every, you know, there's certain podcasts that have become a rite of passage for the for the Mormon community, and I do hope one day I'll get so there. becomes one, one day. becomes one of those rite of passage. Um, yeah. We're we're working towards making that happen because I have wanted more females in that kind of rite of passage Mormon space. Um, I've totally lost my train of thought. Oh, so you're listening to all the podcasts and you're in kind of truth seeking mode. Like what is actually going on with Joseph Smith here? Right. And mm -hmm. then you deconstruct it. Oh, this thing like isn't true or isn't it as true as I thought it was or whatever you conclude from that. And, and then certain things start to sneak up on you. And so you, you feel like you can toss the religion away and go on living your life. And then you start to meet kind of what we call the monsters of the void. And the four that are talked about the most are fear of death, fear of meaninglessness, fear of isolation, and fear of freedom. And these are the deep in our brains existential fears that we have, the things that actually, the more we study this, the things that are driving us to create religion in the first place. And they don't show up right away because you don't know how much religion was keeping these monsters at bay. You don't realize that. And so I'll, I'll have clients come in and they all of a sudden have to re-mourn a parent who had died when they were Mormon, but all of a sudden it hits them that their parent may be gone, right? Because when they went right. through that mourning process with Mormonism, there was a little drug there. We're going to say this story. They're in heaven now. Yeah. We're all going to take this kind of collective drug so we don't have to feel this particular monster and, and be afraid. And so when the religion goes away, we start to realize, oh, that religion was in my brain doing some heavy lifting. It made me not have to face death 
and think about death, I could just bypass that with my little thought ending cliches of he's with Jesus now, right? We could always do that. Mm -hmm. uh, meaninglessness, you know, as a Mormon, you really feel like you're living a meaningful life. I'm giving temple, you know, endowments for people who have been waiting for me for a millennia. Like you feel very special and important in the universe. Uh, and then fear of isolation, you know, Mormonism, we are a tight knit community. When you're in, it can feel really good. It can feel like you're a part of something. You, uh, even though we're masking and it may not be very deep relationships, it's at least a community. It's something. And then fear of freedom. We actually do have a deep existential fear of having to create our own lives because that means that we can fuck up our own lives. Yeah. And this it's is why one. it's a big, it's a big one. one. And it's it's the reason why if all gurus and prophets and leaders died today, we would recreate them tomorrow because mm -hmm. we just want someone to tell us what the hell to do because life mm -hmm. is so insane, right? Mm -hmm. And so religion, Mormonism, we didn't realize, especially as we were playing truth game of whether it's true or not, we didn't realize how much Mormonism was keeping all of those monsters kind of locked away. And so then when the religion leaves, these monsters start showing up and all of the sudden we have these existential fears that we've never had to deal with before. And now we have no tools to deal with. And now we're out there in the void without tools, which is why we mm -hmm. create religions. It's not a fun place to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I titled this, you know, 10 realizations of, of leaving religion and, um, I, as I'm talking to you, I have my list of 40 questions basically. So don't worry, it's not clickbait. We're gonna have probably 100 realizations, very <laughs> minimum with every sentence that you speak especially. And I also wanted to let people know that this is a live stream and um, thank you guys so much for being in the chat right now. And uh, I see some questions coming in. If you have any questions that come up um, that you have for Britt, uh, please ask them and I will put them up on screen and super chats are also amazing and welcome. So yeah, on that subject of, you know, kind of our human existence, you know, when you're given a story of why we're here, what we're doing, that's what Mormon missionaries do is they walk up to say like, you know, there's a plan. Did you know this is how you would fit into it? And for a lot of people, why I want to always be the nuance. So um, for a lot of people, that is their their level up. That is their structure from the place that was chaos. So my parents are, are converts to the church, and I'm so grateful that they converted to the church when my dad my dad was like in his 20s, you know, in and out of jail, selling drugs and being a hippie, the long ponytail and a dog named Poquito. And my mom was in like a, with an al alcoholic father in Detroit in the sixties. Like um, she converted when she was 12 and I'm really grateful that they have that structure now. And uh, for each of us, as we, um, the kind of, when I, me and, me and Britt both spoke at Thrive, which is a post Mormon um, like community um, that is, being built, thrivebeyondreligion.com. It's amazing. And we both spoke in, in Provo a couple of weeks ago. And Britt spoke on depatriarching your your spirituality, right? Mm -hmm. And it was Which is a word I made up. <laughs> I want I like that word though. Because we're both kind of absurdists in that way. We're like, whatever but, works, I'm using it. <laughs> yeah, I'm making up a word. What do you mean there's right words? Like these are yeah. all, this is non this is nonsense gibberish. I'm gonna make yeah. up my own word. <laughs> right. And so what I kind of, I gave my speech about a couple different things. And the, my big topic lately that my mind has been obsessed with since I've been out of the church for four years right now is like a self-actualization and an individuation from more cult-like structures. And it doesn't even have to be the church. The most trauma that I have honestly like incurred in, uh, I don't know, in the church or outside of the church has been in the last four years of, you know, like making relationships, leaving them, reconstructing them, reconstructing my ideas of parenting and femininity mm. and my place in the world. And uh, a lot of that for me has come from needing to, you know, see this cult-like structure from where I was in the church, what it offered me, and then kind of integrating the things that I liked. Um, because I know that you say that, you know, wherever you go, you'll, people, they'll kind of create a new cult in their minds. They'll kind of go into these new things. And I'm sick of making the same mistakes. And it wasn't, um, my sister said something to me, uh, when I was going through, um, 
I feel Brit. Sometimes I feel like when you talk, I'm like, is there, do you have a camera in my house? And you know, just what to say when I'm <laughs> listening to you speak and stuff. I was like, how did you, you, did you know exactly what I was going through during that mental breakdown? And uh, my sister the answer is, is yes. Cause I was yes. having the same mental breakdown. <laughs> exactly. I love you. Um, and my sister, she said to me, she's like, Kara, everybody has to, in their life, everybody has to um, individuate in their lifetime. Maybe it won't be this lifetime, but at some point, she believes in reincarnation, but mm -hmm. she's like, everybody has to individuate. And your chance was when you left the church and you didn't, you didn't get it. You didn't get it. And if there's ever one thing that I kind of want to get across um, to like, you know, deconstructing religious audiences is how susceptible we are to those same structures, to those same things that it, like, you might think that you left the church once. And I know sometimes people are like, ex-Mormonism is a cult. I was like, no, it's each ex-Mormon if you are in Mormonism and you kind of created the God that you worship, I'm like, if you haven't looked inside in those structures um, that made you so susceptible, if you're not really hyper aware of things and very reflective and, and uh, you will be susceptible to a lot of those, you know, uh, uh, like a hive mind basically of, of falling in line with other people. And uh, I think that's one of the most important like aspects of my journey is to in the four years since I left the church is really slowing down and um, making sure that this this entire uh, structure that my brain is so used to is not something that I fall into again, you know? Yeah. And I, and I did the same. So like I can talk nice words now about like facing death and facing uncertainty, but the reality is, is, is I spent after deconstructing Mormonism, I spent years building other systems. So I went into mm -hmm. a master's degree in process theology, which is a different kind of God. It's a, um, it's a God that's in relationship with the world and, and is pro evolution and stuff like that. It was a nice little landing place. And then I built that all up and then that came crumbling down. And then I just kept thinking, I keep doing this. Like I keep just creating some kind of belief structure and then it comes crumbling down and then I'm back to being uh, traumatized again. And then I build something else and I was stuck in that loop. Mm -hmm. And it's really because when you, when you have a cult brain or a, you know, at least a high demand, you know, fundamentalist religion brain, if we don't want to use that word, um, you are most susceptible, you know, when you are leaving a cult is when you are most susceptible to go into another cult. And it's because even though the beliefs have changed, all of those structures in your brain are the same. And so I see this, even if it's not, you know, you jump into fundamentalist Christianity, even if it's more subtle. Uh, for example, I see ex-Mormons really like Sam Harris becomes their new prophet because we have all of this prophet structure in our brains, right. but Russell and Nelson isn't the prophet. And you just stick like Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens or someone and it all the structures are then the same and you don't realize that you've created a new profit mm -hmm. and you're doing this in with various things in order to just plug in what the brain was already doing and mm -hmm. it's a very natural thing to do it's going to be our most natural response when we're leaving how can i plug in something here um which is how my brain has always been working and and how my patterns work and eventually you're going to either have another faith crisis with that thing, or it's going to get more complex, or um, usually you can't keep doing that forever because uh, deconstruction is going to come knocking on, on your door again. And so what we have to, what I really recommend doing and what I would tell myself if I was you know, able to talk to myself 13 years ago who was deconstructing Mormonism, it's this idea that if we face these fears first, if we face uncertainty and sit with yeah. it, if we face death and actually allow that to shift us and change us and actually accept that death is a part of life, if we do that hard work first, then we can go back into the truth game and just play. What's true? What's reality? What's going on with near-death experiences? All of that stuff can be very fun to play with, but we don't need it to be true. If you're jumping into near-death experience, near-death experiences, for example, right after you leave Mormonism, it's because you're looking for, your brain is looking for what's the next thing I can believe in so I can cheat death. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to, like, we want to get away from that. We want to get away from our fears driving the car of our brains saying, what can I believe in so that I can avoid 
this scary thing that I don't want to feel. If we can actually have some tools to face those fears more directly, then we can go into the near-death experience space or the past life space or the new age space or the witch space and play with any tools or, or see what's going on or what's the science saying about all this. And it's playful and it's fun because you don't need something to be true. You're not driven by your fears anymore. And that would be the thing that I would want to tell myself if I could go back, that if we can sit with this uncertainty, if we can make peace with some of these things, then we don't... Um, have to need something to be true in order to function, which is what, mm -hmm. which is the thought loop we, we want to get out of as we're leaving mm -hmm. Mormonism. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I have so many places we could talk. How much time do you have today? I have like 17 <laughs> questions I want to talk to you about. We have a while. Um, Let's keep going. I love oh, this. Oh gosh. Okay. Thank you for the super chat from God's Node. God's Node is here. Finally. Thanks for 10 bucks. Mormonism is a Freemason cult. Obviously Jesus Christ is the truth. All right. We'll get into that. The texts are incomparable. It is very sad to see ex Mormons reject Jesus Christ outright. Mm -hmm. All right, I guess we can. Uh, let's go. Yeah, let's let's do that. Yeah. So, Brittany, why don't you explain your theology degree for a second, and you know, and then kind of, you know, where you came to realize, you know, the gods that we kind of make up in our mind, mm -hmm. and then anything you want to add to that. Yeah. Um, so I have a I have a degree in theology from a Christian seminary, and it's you know the capstone of my master's project was the future of American religion, uh, Gen Z and the future of American religion. So that was my focus. I wanted to see where deconstruction was going. So that was the focus of my degree, and I have an almost doctorate now in applied theology in that space. Um, I ha I'm too lazy to write my my dissertation. So I'm at all but dissertation in that. So I've spent a long time in the Bible and it is a natural thing when you leave Mormonism to say, all right, Joseph Smith is blah, 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 blah. But what about Jesus? Right. It's a very natural thing. I get this question all the time. And what we have to be aware of and what I think this this person is is modeling here is when we don't have an anchor and we lost Mormonism as an anchor, something that I see people doing is grab onto Jesus and say, but this is true. We know that this is true. This is solid. We can put all of our you know, faith in this. And, and the problem with that is that we have more evidence that Mormonism is true than we have that, that, that Jesus existed and did all these things. We have at least some eyewitness accounts, even though they may be problematic, of some miracles. There are people in India today that we have more eyewitness accounts of claimed miracles than we do of Jesus. And so what happens is I know that it's natural to want to say, okay, I lost Joseph Smith, but I'm going to go all in on the Jesus thing. We really don't have enough evidence to do that. The reason we do that is because psychologically, psychologically, it's very scary to not have an anchor, to not have truth, to not have meaning, to not feel special, to not have a story, to not have a community. And if Jesus gives you that, it's going to be a really big temptation and you won't know that you're doing it because it's not a conscious choice, which is why it's so tricky. Uh, it'll be a subconscious choice to grab onto Jesus so that you can avoid the void. You can avoid death. You can avoid uh, all the pains that I'm talking about. But when you really look at Jesus, we are talking about we are talking about a game of telephone for 60 to 80 years before anything was written down. And we know from the history of Mormonism, we can watch how these stories happen, how prophets are made, how something like, you know, Brigham Young looking like Joseph Smith, you know, after, you know, for the succession, we know how that, that, how that myth got started and um, how it spread and then became a story and then became in a manual. We actually can watch that happen in mm -hmm. history. And so when you're saying that we can watch that with Mormonism and we know how that happens, but now we're going to do that 2000 years ago with pre like, like sheep herders, we're going to put all of our, we're going to put <laughs> all of our marbles into this basket. And we have even less evidence of, of who Jesus was than, than we do, you know, Brigham Young being the true prophet and, and this and that. I, we just don't have enough evidence 
to really know who Jesus was. The best we can say is that Jesus was a homeless mystic radical that we made a God out of because we really like having scapegoats. We've had, we've been putting babies and virgins in volcanoes for tens of thousands of years as, as a way that we process guilt and shame as a community. So I think the evidence is much more on the idea that Jesus, his, he may have been an actual mystic, a Buddha kind of character. He may have had some really extraordinary truths. I really love digging into the parables. There are things about Jesus that I still mm -hmm. love that I take with me, but we don't have any evidence that he is anything more than a homeless mystic radical that we created into a God because that's what we do, because we need it. We need him to be a God so that we could avoid death, so that we can have someone tell us what to do, so we can have a community, so we have meaning and purpose. This is what we do, not just with Jesus, but with all religions. And so when I see people say, oh yeah, Mormonism is definitely not true, but but we're sure about Christianity. No, we're not. It's just more mysterious. We just have less documentation. Yeah. That's the only difference. Everything we did was the same. We create prophets and gods because we need them, because we want them. And we've been doing this not just in Christianity, but for tens of thousands of years, we've been doing this. We have tens of thousands of gods. There are 4,000 gods today on offer for you to worship. Eventually, I think you have to take a step back and say, maybe we're not very good at this God game. Maybe there's another way. That was a little rant. My that was a little rant. Yeah, oh that was God. a little... That was a little soapbox, but it sometimes it sometimes irks me when people will say, "Well, Mormonism is obviously not true, but this other religion is like definitely true and magical." And it's like, nope, I don't think we can do that at all. But okay. Mm hmm. Well, that was a mic drop and a half. So, <laughs> but thank you uh, for the ten dollars for supporting Nuanto, and we appreciate yeah. you. <laughs> God's Node uh, had another $10 come in for another question, and I will get to Ooh. that in a second. Um, but yeah, I love everything that you said. I think that's, um, you know, the second half of my deconstruction went kind of like that once I realized that, you know, the things within Mormonism do not add up. It's indistinguishable from a, a fraud. And um, there's no, no believing space that I could operate within. And I was a Jesus freak for seven years and listened to mostly evangelical you know, songs and sermons and Ooh. books and was, I, I, I was more interested in like the grace version of Jesus Christ that right. so many Christians, you know, get on Mormons that they don't worship enough, you know, mm. and I understood that Jesus and I loved that Jesus, but ultimately um, I did come to the realization after deconstructing Mormonism where I was like, okay, great. I can go be a Christian now. Like it's kind of what I've always wanted to do mm -hmm. without, you know, temple handshakes and garments and you no, know, I did. I did too. It's, an, it's a very natural progression. Yeah. 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 But um, the same thing that I realized that I know that you've spoken about, I'd love to hear you kind of even go into further is uh, I realized I, early in my TikToking, I would make videos about what I wish I could tell my Mormon friends. And one of the rants that I would go on was how I realized that everybody has a DIY God is what I referred mm. to it as. I don't know if you have a, a phrase for it as well, but like everybody, I looked around in Mormonism, every progressive Mormon, every Mormon friend, everybody had their ideals of what their God is and they will look for it and they will have a confirmation bias and they will find it within their religion. And ultimately like that works for you. Okay. I understand that, but is it true, true? Like, or is this you imbuing what you wish Jesus Christ would be into the system? That's just not there. And I look at Mormonism differently than Christianity at large because it's so, um, I don't know, homogenous. It's so like centered with these, mm. these leaders, these prophets, this correlated curriculum, as opposed to, you know, any other offshoot of a pastor can start a church anywhere in America. Um, like, is it true, true? Do these people really have these, this authority that they say that they have? Um, but so much of Mormonism and, and religion generally came down to uh, realizing how you can just live these, you, you can just find a better way to live out these ideals without operating in a really unjust system that mm -hmm. upholds things that are actually opposite 
mm-hmm. the of the things that you, the God that you worship is. Yeah, like you, you can know. do the ideals without the mental gymnastics, right? You can you can keep love, you can keep peace, you can keep mm-hmm. all the good stuff. Like I take. I take all of the good stuff with me. I just don't have to play the mental gymnastics anymore to try to make sense of a God in a world, this evil with this much suffering. And that actually is better because then I can just focus on the ideals and that actually makes my life better. Um, Mm -hmm. I had a thought, I lost it. It must've been a a stupor of thought, so it must not have been true. Well, we'll get back to it. That's a deep DNC reference, but um, anyway. Stupor of thought. Um, all right, oh, well, go uh, ahead. No, I can't remember. All right, keep going. It'll come back to me. Oh, no, no I, fa- I remember. I remember. Uh, it was a big realization for me because everybody, when you, when you dig into conversations about what are people meaning by God, you're right. It is, I've never met two gods that are the same. They are mm-hmm. always different. They always really reflect the person. And so when people say, well, yeah, but I have a personal relationship with God. And that's always a cop out when you're in conversation because I'll, I'll ask people about their God and I'll be pointing out inconsistencies. And the easy out is just to say, you know, I don't know it's true, but I have a personal relationship with God. I have a personal relationship with Jesus. And when we actually look at the brain and what is going on here, yeah. It just means you have a personal relationship with your own brain. That is what we are saying when we say we have a personal relationship. Our brains are complex enough to ask and answer its own questions. This is what we're doing when we pray. And we have s- at least some good evidence that that we can hang our hat on that this is what's happening. Mm-hmm. If I were to, for example, uh, e- even something like praying for where my keys are, we know we have terms now that you will think about it consciously and then you'll go about your day and then your subconscious keeps working on the problem, where are my keys? And then when it has an idea of where the keys could be, it pops that idea into your conscious mind. And we know that the brain does this. This we are sure of, the brain can do this. And then we'll say, oh, I had a revelation, God told me where my keys were, right? And so this whole time that we've been playing revelation games in our brains and what part, is Satan talking to me or is God talking to me or is this myself? And we've been doing, all of this work of, of what is God's voice and what is Satan's voice and is this revelation or is this not? And I have a personal relationship with God. We have some pretty good evidence that shows all of this has been happening inside our own minds. And so when people say I worship God or, or I have a personal relationship with God, it's like, I interpret that now in my, with my secular kind of bias uh, as I've been talking to my own brain and I have a relationship with my own brain. And I just got to say, mm-hmm. good for you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because that I think is what's been happening. And so so how can I then get the tool? There is a tool there, though, of, um, of projecting something ideal and working toward it. So right. maybe there's a tool there. But how can I get that tool of supporting conversations in my own mind, of... Um, making goals and and moving towards you know things that i want to move towards how can i get all of those tools that that prayer and projecting out gods was doing without having to play this insane game in my own head and trying to figure out if god's talking to me or if satan's talking to me and Mm -hmm. that when we approach it that way we can get the tools without having to play games with gods because we're just bad at this game Mm -hmm. yeah that's very, very well said. Something that I absolutely experienced myself. And uh, I, you know, you kind of feel like you're isolated sometimes within a religion that you're the only one who is unclear about what signals are coming from where. But I always like relied on like, if I'm following the rules, I'm wearing my garments, I'm obeying the word of wisdom, then I'll have the spirit with me always, which is the promise. And, you know, what comes from me, I will be able to know is from God. Um, but it's a very tricky system with people who have anxiety, scrupulosity, depression. How can God talk to you through all of these, you know, other noises and things in your head? It just seems like a very shoddy system for God mm-hmm. to say, I love you. You're going to return to me, but I'm going to give you a lot of mixed signals and you won't be able to tell what's me, what's from Satan. <laughs> I think John Larson did the math that there's nine demons per uh child on earth right now like per oh, person okay you know that's nice you, yeah you know like the war in heaven that yeah like uh-huh. a third of the house of heaven so that like a third would be like nine demons per mm, the eight billion okay. of us here so that's <laughs> the system that this mormon god set up for instance i'm like seems like he doesn't really want us to get back to him on that kind of plane but yeah 
Uh, so we're going to keep talking about so many other subjects that are near and dear to this deconstructing uh, audience that I love so much. And um, I want to make sure you guys stick around throughout the course of this entire chat interview. And also, no, we're going to talk about Brittany has a book coming out. So make sure you stay till the end. And I also have a trip, a group trip to Greece that I just wanted to let people know. So I'll talk about that at the end too. So you're like, oh, I want to go to Greece with Kara and a bunch of other people and make new friends and find some road of meaning out of my nihilism. August 26, we'll talk about it at the end. Um, so one thing I would love to hear you expand on, I, I uh, am obsessed with the kind of going back to the very beginning, a lot of people who deconstruct, my, my journey was like, okay, Mormonism isn't true, Christianity, how did, how did we get here? How the freak did we get here? And books like Sapiens and Guns, Germs, and Steel and anything that was just like, what is the civilization that I am now interacting with and a part of? I feel like I'm just a product of my genetics and my conditioning. What is that? What does that mean? Where did I come from? And what is the system that I'm supposed to be participating in? Why is it here? Who does it serve? All those kind of like big questions and answers. And that's, that's a kind of the, the, um, one of my favorite spaces to kind of talk through. So in your opinion, experiences, research, what kind of, um, road in your deconstruction did you take to, to kind of go back to, um, as you mentioned, you know, we're all kind of susceptible to cults. So take us back theology professor. Why do we have religion <laughs> and why is our brain so susceptible to cults in the first place? What are the, I'm the nuance. I'd love to say, what is advantageous to our evolution? So what are the, mm. what are the good parts and what are the bad parts? Why do we have mm. religion? Yeah. My favorite book for this, if this is a question that like, um, like Kara said, is on your mind, then I really recommend God, a human history. It's a very mm -hmm. light read of, of how and why we created gods and how they changed over time. So how the gods have always reflected our society at the time. So part of my presentation for Thrive was talking about how before agriculture, our gods uh, were plural. They were much more in tune with nature. Uh, they were much more matriarchy centered. So a very strong goddess or mother earth kind of creation. A uh, female in the center of kind of a pantheon. And then after agriculture, slowly the storm male god became more important and then singular. And then it became just kind of there's only one god who creates everything. Um, and women apparently are not involved in creation, which is insane. And I pause yes, you there. Please. Mm -hmm. When, guys, when Brittany was giving this speech at Thrive and you talked about what we kind of had and lost in our human species and development, I felt the strongest, like everybody was internally like crying and weeping for something that they had lost with the ways that you described what are, what our humanity once um, empowered and uh, uplifted with like the divine feminine and, you know, worshiping this, you know, females bodies that can create these wonderful things and just how much it's shifted as you went through your talk. So again, as much as you want to talk about that and yeah. hopefully you can you're, go find your course and go watch the whole thing because it's yeah i do have a whole course heavy. on on uh how we became a kind of patriarchy religiously and then how we internalized it in ways that we don't recognize especially as women um and how to undo that work and and find spiritual paths that fit your life better as a woman i have a whole course on that on my website if you're interested uh no nonsense spirituality.com but essentially going back to your question um the gods that we've had have always reflected the society. And so you can learn about when people ask why, if you don't believe in God, why are you studying theology so much? And I'm like, this is the best place to study what it is to be human because we project these gods um, that are reflections of us, that are reflections of our society. They're reflections of what we want and what we fear. And I have learned more about human nature by studying gods that don't exist than I have anything else. It's how I learned what we are. And as far as how did we get here, our, our, our lead theory on that is that evolution did reward us for being superstitious. So the lead theory, it's called HAAD, hyperactive agency detection, I think is what it is. And it's essentially when you look at a tree and you can kind of see a face in it and 
our ability to do that where we think that things are human around us and have agency like I sometimes will think the printer is out to get me because why would it not be working right before <laughs> I need it to work because and the toaster is like in cahoots with it because the toaster wasn't working this morning. And those kind of patterns that we do of thinking that the toaster is out to get me or there's a face in the tree. We actually have some evidence to show that we naturally do this as humans. We apply agency and human characters to things that are inanimate around us. And what it did is it helped to keep us alive because it helped us look for patterns and be on our guard. And so our best explanation now for why we have religion is someone is hunting, they see a face in the tree and they have a really good hunt and they think the tree with the face in it really helped on this hunt because I saw it smile at me today and it was watching over me. And now I'm going to do a little ritual with this tree before I go on a hunt. And then when we started to do the communal ritual around the tree to help us on the hunt, we were more bonded as a tribe. We started to take care of each other better. We started to, to develop rituals that helped our group to be more cohesive so that we could survive better than other groups. And we are the descendants of those people, the people who were the most superstitious, the people who developed the rituals because of those super superstitions and therefore developed strong group cohesion, we are the descendants of those people. And so evolution in any species, it doesn't reward us for seeing ultimate reality. What we see, and this is where you get into some Donald Hoffman stuff where, where you recognize that we're not really seeing reality, we are seeing the colors that evolution wants us to see and other animals see colors that evolution needs them to see right and so we really not benefit we don't benefit from seeing whatever ultimate reality is we see based on evolutionary fitness and that's how we survive so we saw faces and trees and we thought those trees may have agency just like we do. And when we do that, this natural instinct that we have as humans, we started to create religions, we started to create rituals, we started to think that the shaman and this plant medicine was then talking to said tree, and now we have a fully functioning religion. And we've been doing this at least for 50,000 years before that, it starts to get a little bit iffy, iffy but we we've been doing this a long time before Christianity. And so when someone comes to me and says, oh, the Christian God has always been God. Okay, what about the 250,000 years that we've been humans with these exact same brains doing the same things and the gods that we have on cave walls and the gods, the goddess statues like Venus is 65,000 years old. Um, what about all these people? Do they not matter to your Christian God? We've been doing this for a long time. And so essentially we are the descendants of superstitious people. And so it's a lie of atheism to say that we're born atheist. We may be born atheist in the sense that we don't, we're not born with a particular God, but we are born superstitious. If you put 10 people on an Island and wiped their memories, they would create a religion. We would. Mm -hmm only science and education and learning about your brain biases and reading sapiens yeah. and doing all this stuff can undo that we are naturally superstitious and when we have our superstition and start creating rituals and communal bonds we start packing more and more into that religion that we need oh we need some way to not fear death we need stories we need narratives we need meaning so we need service we need purpose and we just start stuffing more things that we need into the religion until it's this system that our brain wants because then we can avoid our fears and we can have the human needs. Um, mm -hmm. It's absolutely amazing. That you were talking about. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, the scapegoat thing shows up long before Jesus. And some people will say, oh, it's because it was always, you know, it was, it was called, it was pointing us to Jesus. And I was like, how many children had to die in child sacrifices and how many virgins had to die in volcanoes in order to point to Jesus. That just seems like very sick. That It's much more likely, I think, that we do this because it was actually a ritual that we found that if we could put all of our 
problems onto one thing and send it off into the desert, it, it actually helped us as a community to be able to bond together and, and move forward. So once you get into how our brains work, you can see why we create religion, why we're superstitious, and why we start packing more and more things into our superstitions so that we can function as these humans who got smart enough to realize that we're going to die. Mm-hmm. Boom. Yeah. Humans that got smart enough to realize that we're going to die. Um, yeah, we got too smart. So true. Uh, just want to do a quick shout out. Thank you guys. This helps the channel so much. I am um, just a small business owner. I'm a, I'm just a woman out here in the world trying to make a business and a <laughs> podcast and do help. So thank you, Edward, for the super sticker, super sticker. And um, Adele Turner, thanks for the five bucks. She says, I so needed this. Thank you both for all the work you do and all that you share. I know I'll be revisiting this discussion again and again. Yeah, I will um, make sure to put up some time codes after this discussion is over. It'll be available as well on my podcast, The Mormon History Hoedown, on Apple, Spotify, wherever you guys get your podcasts, patreon.com slash nuanceho. I put up all this stuff ad free as well. So thanks, guys. I am um, on that topic. Uh, I, going back to, you know, my more conservative Christian Mormon brain. My argument back to that would have been like, I could see where you're coming from. Yeah, that's all true. That's, you know, you said like, it's pointing you to Jesus. I would have still said like, at least, you know, it gives an answer. It gives what I feel like is the best answer because we didn't just pop out of nowhere because we are such, you know, intelligent, conscious creatures. So when people, you know, what are some of the common pushbacks that you get or mm. what would be your response to yeah, that, like that the one that you just said is probably the one that I get most often, which is which is this is at least a you know a theory that answers this question, whereas atheists are just absolutely insane because you think something comes from nothing, and I that's that's a very very common argument, and I see especially like Christian pastors uh, repeat that argument a lot, and so what I say to that is neither science nor religion at this point can tell us why there's something rather than nothing. Like this is a foundational question in philosophy. Neither one can can really tell us. But here's what I think we can't do. A lot of people think that if you place a God in that question, then the problem is solved. Oh, there's there's a creation. There must be a creator. And people tell that I would say every single day on TikTok, I, I would get someone saying, you're so dumb for thinking that uh, there could be a watch this is the watchmaker argument. You could walk on the beach and find a watch and not think that it was created by something that it just formed by itself. Like you're so stupid, right? And what they don't realize is they didn't solve the problem. They just backed it up a step. Mm -hmm. So when you say that it solves the problem because you put a God into that question and then God creates everything, uh, you're saying that the, uni the universe is complex and it has complex rules. There's lots of complexity as, as to why it supports life on earth and complex things need a creator. They just don't appear. Okay. That's the argument. The problem with that is when you add a God, God is more complex than the universe. And so if things that are complex need a creator, then in your argument, something needed to create God. So in philosophy, we call this the law of eternal regression, which means you didn't solve the problem. You just have then something created your God and then something created that God and something created that God and it goes back forever. And you actually didn't solve the problem because you still don't know what the first step is. How did the first God come into existence? Uh, Mormonism actually has some interesting ideas on that. I think much more interesting than Christianity, much more philosophically interesting than Christianity by saying that God was the first one to come into awareness. And uh, then we are kind of co-created with God. And then Jesus was the second and Holy Ghost was the third to kind of come into existence. And it, Mormonism has some interesting philosophical I ideas on that, that um, I find it, at least interesting, more interesting than just uh, God has always been there. Because if God can, if you're saying that a complex thing can just exist and always have existed, well, then you can do that with the universe. Mm -hmm. If a complex thing can just exist, then why can't the universe just exist? Because you just did that with God. So people think right. that they're solving the problem when they put the God in the middle of it, but either that God has always existed, which means some things just exist, 
or something created your God, and then you're back to where you started. So mm -hmm. I think this question is fundamentally mysterious. We don't know what consciousness is. We have a problem of hard consciousness. We also have a problem of matter. Um, we don't know what the hell is going on with like quantum theory and some of it gets counterintuitive, but all of that is, is this is the magic of reality. The great thing about leaving religion and, and leaving God behind is you get to actually dig into the real magic, which is what the fuck is going on with this world. That like reality, whatever it is, is more magical and more mysterious than even our religion's explanations of what, what is going on. And so I don't think a jump into atheism or leaving religion means that you lose magic. It means that you leave behind first century magic to actually dive into the magic of reality in a 21st century conversation with all the science that we have now that they didn't have then. Mm -hmm. All right, let's turn it, uh, let's turn up the heat um, and go straight to hell with our, you know, moral relativism or whatever <laughs> and the yeah. realities that we make up for ourselves. So um, absolutely agree. And yeah, you're adding more complexity to something. Somebody's trying to give you an answer and now just added more complexity. I have to, you have to like make a whole new cake now in a new oven in a new kitchen. I'm just like, I don't need any cake or kitchen right now. So those are definitely um, a lot of the ideas and realizations that I came to right after I deconstructed Mormonism. And so everything that you're saying, you know, I was like, yes, absolutely. Got it. You know, listening to different, you know, atheists looking into logical fallacies, seeing if things pass muster and so forth. And then it's like, we can talk about that and be like, logically doesn't make sense. But then it's the living in that reality now without that structure and without, you know, this meaning and purpose that has gotten our species to the point that we're at today, talking into microphones and sharing ideas. <laughs> so let's get into the, the nihilism that so often we are confronted with. So um, I didn't know that there was really a, a big word for it. I was just like, this sucks. And I thought I was supposed to be happier. It just sucked. And I had to, I didn't know that there was philosophy or, you know, expanded reasons around it. And um, yeah, so if you want to just kind of like define nihilism and talk a, a little bit more about, you know, what that kind of stage was like for you personally. Mm. Um, and um, I think as vulnerable as you want to be, it's up to you. But uh, definitely yeah. a dark night of the soul for many of us. Yeah, and, and for me too. So I'm going to continue the trigger warning that if hearing about suicidality um, triggers something in you, then this would be the time to walk away from, from this conversation because we're going to go there. So for me, uh, I lost Mormonism and then I lost Christianity. And both of those were painful, um, but losing God was more painful for me than losing Mormonism. Same. And yeah. losing kind of sense of self and free will and some of these other anchors at the same time. Uh, my Mormon deconstruction was hard and it was isolating and uh, it, it certainly rocked my world. But it was nothing. It, honestly, it was nothing compared to losing everything, like losing every psychological anchor, losing, mm -hmm. losing God and sense of self and really just feeling like a product of evolution that I couldn't control. Like that mm -hmm. was really disorienting for me. Um, some people don't have a problem with that. I, I really, that really bothered me. The thought that I got stuck in, and this would be my darkest thought where I started to dissociate and I started to, when I say started to lose my grip on reality, I meant, I mean that I could easily have gone to a mental institution at this time. Like, mm -hmm. like I, looking back, I probably should have gone to a mental institution. I had young children at the time, so I just kind of uh, tried to stay alive for them, but I was losing my grip on reality and going insane, especially because I was so alone. Like you, I didn't know there was a word for this. I just thought that uh, everybody else is in some kind of matrix that I no longer can see in the same way that they do. And I'm out here floating and nobody understands me. But my mm -hmm. darkest thought in that place was um, if I'm just a product of evolution 
And evolution is this machine that says survive at all costs because evolution doesn't care about if you're happy. It just cares mm -hmm. about if you make babies, right? Evolution doesn't care about the female organism. The, the evolution doesn't care about happiness. It's a real, it's a real douchebag, especially for women. We're more neurotic uh, because of evolution, because it, it helps us to be more in tune with our child. So for women, especially like evolution does not care, give a shit about your happiness. Mm -hmm. So if evolution is just this machine that says survive at all costs, and this machine is violent, like even if you're a vegan, like don't, if you're a vegan and you tell me that you've got, gotten out of this, you haven't. That's just an illusion. In order to eat and survive, you kill conscious life. Conscious life that is e even plants, right? E Late stage the, capitalism on a finite planet of resources. Like, <laughs> like, like you are going to um, affect conscious creatures by being alive. And so my darkest thought was if I didn't consent to this universe and this is just a system of violence and suffering, then the most moral thing that I can do is withdraw my consent from this universe that I did not consent to be born into. And if I didn't have children, I may have acted out that thought. It was very dark. I was completely dissociated. I would wake up in the morning. I would, like a video game character, put on human clothes and play my stupid little human game. And I only did it because the other characters in the video game cared about my character. And so yeah. I would do it, but I just wanted to unplug the whole stupid thing. It was so stupid to me. Reality, life, everything was so stupid and so dumb and I hated everything. And I was mad at the universe. Why would the universe create this brain that could think and then not give me any answers. And this is the end to all of my truth seeking my whole life. This is where it ends. And it was rough. And like I said, in my Mormon stories podcast, looking at especially my oldest son, uh, who's old enough to, you know, the, I, I really have a sense of, of his personality. He wasn't a baby at the time. Like, you know, he's a good, sweet kid. And knowing that, if I acted out this thought, his life would change, it's, you know, his experience of life would change, uh, kept me alive during that time. So I went mm -hmm. very dark, very dissociated, very dark, should have gone to a mental institution. I was gone. I was pretending to be a human. I was an alien at that point, like really, really far gone. Mm -hmm. And something can happen in that space that is positive. This is as rock bottom as I can imagine. That's where I was. I had nothing. I had no one. I didn't know years from that point that I'd be talking to someone about this who would understand or, or be compassionate or, or be able to resonate in, in this space. Um, at the time, it just felt like I'm the only person who feels like an alien in their own body and hates mm -hmm. all of this. So the thing that helped me to get out of that space is I was obviously ready to do something quite drastic um, with my life because I was so done with how stupid all this human system stuff is. And so th the thought came by continuing to dig into philosophy. I was still listening to podcasts. I was still trying to make sense of what was happening to me. Um, and I came across Albert Camus, who's a French uh, philosopher, mm. who really talked about if you're ready to do something drastic, why not drastically change your life into something that's worth experiencing? Right. And there's this, the more I talk about this, the more I find thousands of others now who have read the myth of Sisyphus and said that it's changed your life. But it's this shift into, if this is just a video game, you're depressed because you're playing the wrong game. You don't, you just don't like this game. What if there's a video game that you would like to play? Like right now you're playing Mortal Kombat, but you really love Mario Kart. Like not because you get to the end of Mario Kart, not because there's ultimate meaning and purpose when you're playing Mario Kart, but you just love to play the game when you're in it. And so that was the shift for me was, okay, maybe I'm just playing the wrong game here. What if there's a game that's worth playing just for the experience of it, just like a video game. And then instead of 
doing something drastic as far as unaliving, I started to make drastic moves in other ways, uh, taking big risks in authenticity. This right now is uh, easy for me to do in conversation. The first couple of times I started talking about this, mm -hmm. very scary, very mm -hmm. vulnerable. I felt very naked. I don't, I don't feel that anymore because I've practiced this a lot. Um, but at the beginning, I was starting to take big risks in authenticity to find people that I could be fully human with, right? That I could yeah. talk about with. And I found people who um, I, can, I can be totally myself, where this conversation would be totally normal to have. Um, and then I started taking big risks in other areas in, like I said, in, in how you parent and how I authentically wanted to, to show up for that. And even this job, like I, the title, uh, spiritual direction is a program. I did, a, I did do a two year program after my theology degree to, to do the work that I do now, but an atheist spiritual director is really a title that I made up, right? It fits me. It fits what I do. I had no idea that a sing that I'd have a single client, but because I was taking such big risks into if they're, if I'm going to work, this would be the work yeah. that I would most love to do is to meet people in this space. I just went all in because What's the worst that can happen? I've already died. Like I was mm -hmm. dead. What could you do to me that mm -hmm. I haven't already done to myself? And so once you can start to play with the matrix, play with these walls, play with this video game in some ways, then you can actually start playing the game that you want to play. So my life now, uh, I don't have any suicidal ideation anymore. I also don't have dissociative depression uh, or depression currently. Um, and it's because my life is fine tuned and intentional with how I want to show up and meet it. It is the work that I want to be doing with the people that I want to be doing with the conversations that I want to have. And as much as you can, right? Like I still have to like be human and, uh, like my daughter has a birthday party on Saturday and I'm going to have to do like small talk with parents that I don't know. And I'm already dreading it. And yeah, like there's some things that you have to do that you don't necessarily love. But it's because I'm, I choose to do those things or I choose to interact in that way because it's getting me what I want, which is I want my daughter to feel really loved and seen on her birthday. That's important yeah. to me. Right. And so my life now, um, I, I don't I don't I don't wake up wanting to die like I used to. I woke up today and said, today's going to be a great day. I'm going to have a conversation with Nuance Home and I know that it's going to be a great time. And so when that's the benefit of the dark night of the soul is it forces you to take the risks because you've already been through so much, you've already died. Now anything less than that is easier. And I couldn't have done this, the life that I've created now, I couldn't have done that in Mormonism. I cared too much about what people think. I was people pleasing and not knowing that I was people pleasing. I had anxiety about Man. how I look and image and ego. I couldn't have created this. I couldn't have gone on TikTok Man. and had thousands of haters every day, but I don't care. Like I, I write my TikToks because that's what I'm thinking about that day. And this is part of how I create. I have, I heard a podcast and that's an interesting idea. And then I write my little TikTok and then I put it out into the world and it's how I create. And so if I get haters, like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Right. But I couldn't have done that when I was Mormon, that would have bothered me too much. I think, mm -hmm. I, I don't think I would have been ready for that. Mm -hmm. So I've been to some dark places, but if you're there, if you're listening and you're there, um, the best place, the reason that the dark night of the soul shows up in our stories, shows up in the hero's journey, shows up in the heroine's journey, shows up in our movies, shows up uh, in our religions is because it's the place where only your honest, most authentic life worth living can survive that place. Pretense, ego, reputation, what you should do, your parents' opinions yeah. fall away. They don't mean shit, right? In that place. Only honesty can survive that place. And that's when you get really honest about what a life is worth living and hopefully get a little bit of bravery to work towards that. And when you do, life gets better. Brittany, you're amazing. A, thanks for sticking around because the life worth living that you are uh, talking to me right now and I'm talking to you and people are listening is from two people who have gone through that. And I've said to myself, like, 
I don't care what anyone's expectations are of me. Like the life that I'm living right now is not worth it. So you tear it down mm -hmm. again and you tear it down again. And like, yeah, the only thing that survives is like an extra more intentional version of the last time you had mm -hmm. that dark night, the last time you had that breakdown, you know? So that's all beautiful and vulnerable and just the real shit of life, you know? And uh, you're a mom, I'm a mom. And there is mm -hmm. something um, that's deep in my mama's soul of like, uh, not just when you bring kids into the world, but also when you're like, I, uh, there's, I would expect my, any parent, you know, I'd expect my parents to do hard things and we get on our parents for not always doing hard things, but they do the best that they can. And, um, I know that I can always do better, push harder and, um, be more intentional in, uh, you know, surviving this life in this video game, even when the nihilism does get really dark and does take over. And, uh, trauma seem too too intense so this that's... is this is where we really become pioneers because yeah. not only are we the first in our line for a while your parents are converts but for most mormons you're going to be the first in your line to uh be facing this and when i say i when i say you're the first in your line to be trying to do life while facing nihilism and existential fears and without god i mean like for thousands of years you may be the first person trying to do this because before mormons there was a religion and before that religion there was a religion and before that religion there was a community that worshiped trees and so you really may be for a long time maybe even a hundred thousand years or more the first person trying to raise kids without a collective myth uh, or without some kind of story that makes it all okay. That makes it and all okay. <laughs> that makes it all okay. Yeah. And that is some serious pioneer shit to be doing. And it is hard and we are trying yeah. to gather tools for our children so that they can have the tools to build their authentic life without having to go through the paths that we had to go through to get there. So hopefully mm -hmm. we can find some tools not only for ourselves, but so that our kids uh, have some tools to be able to, to create that and, and be settled in, in their anxiety around all of this in life. And we may be the first generation to really be doing that. And so mm -hmm. it's a lot, it's a lot to ask, especially of a mother to not only heal herself and heal her family line and heal all of the wounds that she holds yeah. in her body and to survive nihilism and to live another day and to recreate her lone life and recreate her beliefs and her relationships, but to also try to do that and gather some tools for her children. No other parent has had to do that if you've had a shared myth and if, if you've had a shared community because that was done for you. And yes, there's mm -hmm. problems with that. There's always problems with that, but at least you didn't have to create a religion on your own. And a lot of us are really trying to create that on our own and it's hard and, and it's, um, something that we've never done as humans before mm -hmm. lived with eyes this wide open to our own mortality. We've never had to do that before. Lift with eyes wide open to this, our mortality. Okay. Poet. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to read some comments and super chats in a second, mm -hmm. but one thing that I really resonated with me that oh, I'm going to start crying so much. This is like testimony meeting. Um, when you were in your Mormon stories interview and you talked about some of that darkness and you were talking about your son, you mentioned it a little bit just now, but I remember you in that, in your Mormon stories interview talking about like, you know, you don't really know what, what we're here doing, what, what this meaning is, but you know, if you did take your own life that, you know, your son's happiness matters and that's what matters. And so on that subject of like, trying to figure out what this reality is like how do you um talk to people about you know ultimate reality and you know what's happening in this moment versus you know what our future is what our past is and how it just like we when we come from a structure from mormonism everything is like where we came from what are uh, you know our, the second estate what we're striving for in heaven, what, mm -hmm. you know it's our never, map our map of the yeah. universe you and are here never it's never quite like, you know, being in the moment and observing reality for what it is right now. And uh, if there's anything else that you wanted to say about uh, yeah. ultimate reality, because my personal, like most like depressive moments are when my reality is just broken 
and it's everything you've talked about, like the chaos and everything. And there's no rebuilding. My brain is just like, this is the end. Like there is no reality to hold on to at all anymore. There's no video game. There's nothing I want to be here to do. It's just, it's a broken reality. But that's the thing that I've, I've held on to the most is like, like I'm, I'm so happy to, uh, like the, 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 the only person that is in my mind and my consciousness, whether Mormon God was there or not, <laughs> since my, since I was being a little girl was wanting to be a mom, you know, and, and, and holding on to the, that value of, you know, wanting my child's happiness to come before my own. And like we just said, pushing through and doing things that we are lifting with our eyes wide open to reality, um, and our mortality. So how do you, um, yeah, how do you work around those things? And I'd love for you to talk more about how we observe reality. Yeah. Yes. I started tearing up too, as you were talking about it, because at the, like I said, in my Mormon stories, my darkest moments were, uh, you know, I'm going through this? this logically. Yeah, actually I do. Um, I was going through this logically, but then something was still there experientially and I couldn't explain it. And it was this, it was this moment where, uh, for example, you can know logically that everything that you do today or your whole life will be forgotten in three generations. And for most people, you have kind of a death where you die, and then you have a second death where anyone who remembers you or anything you've done on the earth also dies, and we kind of call it your second death. So mm -hmm. logically, I can know that the universe doesn't care, and everything that I get that I do is going to be forgotten. And if you stay in that only logical space as if you're a robot, which looking back, I, I wonder why, um, uh, why I guess my personality, like I was really just only thinking about this logically as if I am a robot, but I'm not, we're not robots, we're not computers. And so when you only think about that from that logical point of view, it can suck the life out of you that there's nothing that I wanna do because what nothing lasts, nothing matters. like the sun is going to blow up and the earth is going to blow up. And then if we don't blow up ourselves first and the universe will not care and all of our writings and what, who Joseph Smith was and what we were, it may be true that the universe does not give a shit. And so how do you like live with that truth all the time? Especially when we as humans have never had to do that before. We've always had a story about why we're special. And our tribe is always God's favorite tribe, always. In every religion, you're God's favorite. So how do we do this? And what shifted with me with having children is you can know that the earth is going to blow up someday. But when you look in your child's eyes, when you are excited to pick them up after, your, after their first day of kindergarten, and you just want to look at their face and know if they had a good day, and you mm -hmm. want to listen to if they made any friends and did they like their teacher, and you're looking into their eyes, logically, I can still say that the universe doesn't care. But my body knows that that moment matters. Mm -hmm. And that's something because we're not just logical robots we experience, we have yeah. this kind of experience soup that we're in. And so that pointed me towards, there must be something more going on here than just my logical brain saying there's no reality or, you know, we're not interacting with ultimate reality. Um, and that's when I started to move from just living in my head, which I'd done my whole life to moving back into my body, which was, Really, if you're a head person, then your body is just there to take your head from place to place. That's all I use my body for. Mm -hmm. And I started for the first time paying attention to my body. Mm -hmm. That when I was, yeah. when the kid was coming off the bus, my body knew, even if my logical brain said, it doesn't really matter. My body says, no, this matters a lot. This really matters. Because we're more than computers that need some kind of grand purpose. The experience is the purpose. I get mm -hmm. to experience being a mother. I get to experience watching them grow up and discover who they are. That in this universe where you won the lottery of getting to experience and you're not a tree, you get to be a human and you're not a human slave. You actually get to get up and walk around. 
oh my God, that is the lottery of the universe that you get to experience being. And when I moved into that place, that's mm -hmm. when my life changed because what do I want to experience? I am so excited. Oh my God, there's another Game of Thrones series coming out soon. I am so glad I'm alive. When I watched mm -hmm. Hamilton for the first time, I am so glad that I got to be alive to watch Hamilton because that was the shit. That was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I loved that. And mm -hmm. I get to see uh, my kids come home from school today and it's actually 70 degrees in Boise. It's going to be our first day that, that the sun is out and we're going to go to the park and I get to try to play tennis in this body. That's amazing. That's incredible. And so when you go back into your body and look at this as an experience, as a ride, as a roller coaster, how does this body like to play? It's almost like going back to how we were as children. When you were four, you didn't go out and play because it was your to-do list or because God told you to or because it mattered to the universe. You were just so in your body that it just came out of you. You just skipped mm -hmm. stones. You just played pretend. You just played soccer. You just went and rubbed your dog's belly because it liked it. And we forget, we as adults, we forget how to go back to that place. But when you start going back to that place, and every religion will point to this too, even Jesus, of is there a way that you can go back to how you were as an inner child? So for Jesus, mm -hmm. it's, it's becoming like a little child. For Buddha, mm -hmm. it's beginner's mind. Do you remember when you used to play an experience, not because you needed a reason to, but for the experience itself? Mm -hmm. And that was a big shift for me. As a, uh, if you're a truth seeker, that is often where I see truth seekers get stuck because they're looking for a reason. They're looking for a philosophy. They're looking for something to hold on to as far as truth. And if we let that go, because I don't think that we're interacting with ultimate reality at all, you can actually shift back into experience itself that the universe may not care about my kids getting off the bus today, but my body, my body cares about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My, my body's going to be looking at their faces to see if they had a good day or bad day. And if they're crying, the universe may say, I don't care, but my body will grab that child, right. And hold her to my body. And something happens there. That's, that's ancient as, as mothers, we, we can know sometimes how to mm -hmm. hold our children in the way that mothers have been holding children for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And there's something sacred about winning the lottery of experience that I missed when I was in truth seeker brain. And this mm -hmm. is where truth seekers get stuck. So I think one of the reasons that you res that our stories resonate and why uh, you and I have similarities is because you're, you're a truth seeker too. And this is where truth seekers get stuck. Mm hmm. Brittany, yes, yes, yes. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, so many things that I want to add to that. And uh, kind of what I hear you saying to summarize um, and the way it goes through my brain is, yes, you you can be thinking too much about the, you know, the lack of ultimate meaning and reality. And um, when you talk about deconstructing too hard, or, you know, once you become aware of your ego and then everything about noticing your ego, you feel like is ego and you're just like the Spider-Man meme. You're just like, what is real? Who am I? What is actually me versus what I think is me versus what people want me to be? And then uh, what I, I have truly gotten to way after I left the church um, was uh, living life, yes, for the experience that wasn't the... Um, you know, wasn't as external experiences, but very internally made experiences where I was like, how would I treat myself if I, or how would I treat somebody else if they were my friend and I cared about them? I'm going to treat myself like that every day about like, what do I want to do? What would, mm. what would make me happy? And it was like, I don't want to yeah. get out of bed if I was treating myself and my, if I was a clone of myself and it's like, Kara, what can I do for you? Be like, can you bring me a cup of coffee? And it was like, the game that I'm playing is I'm two people and I'm going back and forth mm. and serving myself just to get the things done because it brings me the dopamine and it brings me happiness. And I feel like I'm my own best friend, you know, mm. and just like starting from places of the experience that I want to have right now is drinking a cup of coffee. The experience mm. that I want to have right now is, um, you know, this swinging. is where you get in. Yeah. Like where you're, you're discovering yourself 
more mm -hmm. than you choose who you are. And that's that can be a shift. And it it's especially hard for Mormon women because we wrapped our identities around serving others, right? And we we didn't get to sometimes even finish making a personality, which can make this hard. Mm -hmm. uh, if mm -hmm. I'm meeting a Mormon woman in this space, uh, sometimes it's easier when I'm working with a man who has a fully developed personality where we can lean into that. But if you're in this space and you never finished developing an ego and a personality, uh, and a voice, and you don't even know what you like to do because you never finish that journey. Mormonism cut that off, cuts that off for Mormon women pretty young. We start to repress that as Mormon women. Then you're going to get extra stuck because not only are you stuck in this nihilism place, but if the way out is authentic living and you don't know who you are, you actually have to date yourself first. That'll mm -hmm. be your first step. And nobody in the spiritual world is talking about be selfish and date yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Because all the men are like, dissolve your ego and and uh, go do ayahuasca and do all these things. And it's like, yeah, that's great if you have Don't an have laundry. Yeah, if you have an overdeveloped personality where you are stuck in your own identity and you need to break that open, sure, go do psychedelics and go do a head dissolving meditation. That's all great. Mm -hmm. If you don't know who you are and you never got to build that up, that is not going to help you. In fact, that may psychologically destabilize you. You already don't know who you are. Yes, <laughs> me too. Right. I remember I did this one. There's a famous meditation. Uh, it's called the headless way where you work with your head until you realize that you're not behind your eyes and you're not really a self. It's just kind of universe. And for four days, I was completely dissociated. Like, I wouldn't think that's my hand. I would just say there's a hand like I was gone. And it's because why are we dissolving, especially as ex Mormon women? Why am I trying to dissolve an ego and a personality and a sense of self that I've never developed because we're Mormon women? Um, and this is another place where people really get stuck because then we can't go into that authentic life. We have to first do what resonates in your body. What yeah. voices do you like to listen to? What, um, and, and for some women, they really don't know because they've mm -hmm. never gotten a chance to try. And so we'd have to do that first. Yeah. And then it's like, am I being the, like the thing that I came from? Am I being the narcissist? Am I being like the egomaniac, you know, that thinks about themselves? It's, that's, it's a really dangerous place um, when you're more prone to like high amounts of like, self-reflection and wanting to be on this track of like the best version of yourself as opposed to like I just want to be a version of myself that uh can can hold myself um and reparent myself in times where um you know I'm feeling at a loss but like you will not develop that unless you feel really comfortable with you know making mistakes and cringing and stuff and that's partially good for me because I have most of my, like I said in my Thrive speech, you guys can go watch it. It's on my YouTube channel. You know, a lot of that has been on camera, you know, on TikTok for the last three years as I'm deconstructing, but also it's, um, it's a complicated game to play to, to kind of develop yourself outside of this religion while also not wanting to go insane because mm -hmm. like, you feel like you're, you're doing it wrong or you're doing it cringe or people are looking yeah. at you doing it just for the sake of like, I'm having experiences and I just pick up the tools along the way. And I just, mm. I just am, uh, go through really, really dark times where I'm like, I can't believe that I did that. I can't believe that I was that stupid, but like picking up the, the tools of, uh, comforting myself in, you know, all the ways that I just understand I'm going to be a person who makes mistakes and I reintegrate the good things leave the bad and just keep trucking along life. But it's not, it's not easy. This whole entire podcast is kind of about like the realizations that you make. And we're kind of half of this. I hope people are picking up what we're trying to put down that it's not, um, it's nihilism and all these parts of the church that you leave. Um, it's not something that you like really want to wish on the wrong person. You know, it's, it's, it's a hard, yeah. hard, hard thing to go through. And that's why I want to be in this space. Like if I'm going to, speak about Mormon history and help people deconstruct the, the other stuff yeah. and being authentic about what we actually go through. Yeah. The and best, I, the best friends, the best tools that we could ask for. And it's still hard for people. Like yeah, me. totally. It's still hard. And I think you're pointing to the ethics of this when you say that I don't want to just push people into this with no tools. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Because we, um, 
I, I would, and again, I learned this just like you, where I learned this from experience on the go and had to change my mind about something because when you're leaving Mormonism and it's, it's not true and it's caused you trauma and you, like, I went through a phase of just like burn it all down, like burn it all down. I'm going to tell everyone about, obviously everybody's going to want to know about Mormon history, right? Like everybody in my friend, family and friend and group in my ward, like they're going to want to know this and burn it all down. Right. And then I had a friend, uh, have an attempted suicide. And I realized that there, there are some ethics to consider when you talk about this space. And I have to be, I, I try to be very careful on TikTok because I don't want to push someone into nihilism who doesn't have the tools in that space because I don't want people to suffer and I don't want people to die, right? Sometimes the religious groups will say, well, you're going to hell and I don't care. And sometimes atheists can say, well, this is true and I don't care if the truth makes you kill yourself. I don't want, I, I don't want any of that. I want religion to get better for the people who are in it. And I want the secular world and, and atheists and post-religious groups uh, to develop more tools so that we don't lose people to unaliving and numbing behaviors, which happens mm -hmm. with nihilism. Fundamentalism is more dangerous to others, like more violence, more strapping a bomb to your chest kind of thing. But nihilism is more damaging to yourself. You're going to turn to numbing de behaviors and, and want to unalive. And I, I don't want either, right? I don't want to have to choose. I don't want either. And so there are ethics when we talk about this. And, and so when you are going into these spaces where you're, where you're talking about these things, unless we're offering tools, it may be unethical to push people into because never in human history have we had a society or mm -hmm. people who have had to face existential fears and know this much about ourselves and our own brains and science and have no tools as far as community and institutions and a path and belonging. And even the kids today, like they're not growing up with a nesting period where these are your friends and family and this is the little world and they get to grow a personality and they get to like, we're missing all of that. And so never in human history, if we had to deal with so much as far as what we know about ourselves and our awareness of our own death and the awareness of the amount of suffering in the world. Like we didn't know how much suffering was going on in the world. We didn't have an eye on the world the, all the time like we do now. So not only have to hold all that, which our nervous systems are not built for, but now we have less tools because we don't live in communities like we used to and we don't have mm -hmm. a shared myth like we used to. And so when we, like when you and I are saying it's hard, it's not just like, it's hard. Like my marathon was hard. Like, no, like humans aren't built for this. It's hard. You know what yep. I mean? And so, um, there are ethics to consider when we talk about this. And so I only want to talk about it in a way that, uh, cause pe people are already there, right? I don't want to push people into this, but I also want to the talk to the people who are already there to develop tools to help. And so, I don't just try to push people into nihilism and then say like, enjoy your numbing behavior addictions because you're not going to be able to handle this because humans aren't built to handle this. I want to say, if you're here, if you've deconstructed here, I've gone through it too. My life got better. Here's some tools that helped me because that's, I think the only way that we can do this ethically because we are, we do lose people in this space and I don't want to be, I don't want to be such a missionary for what I think the truth is that people die. Like I, mm -hmm. I that, right. that bothers me. That feels like I'm going to be a missionary. And, and if you don't listen to me, you're going to go to hell. Like I remember that from being in religion. Like I don't, I don't want either side of that. I want religion to get better and I'll be a part of those conversations of how do we make religion better. And I want the secular world to get better so that we all ha can meet in the middle where you have tools to deal with life and you can live a meaningful mm -hmm. life and you're not hurting people. Like there's a place in the middle for both of those that we can get mm -hmm. to. Uh, and so I still will be involved in, in religious conversations or uh, certain aspects of, you know, watching the religious conversations because I still do care about that community too. And there's ethics to consider on both sides. Mm -hmm. This is such a good conversation. Jade says, and I agree this is my favorite thing to talk about in the world. When we were talking about, you know, if you, this is the reality 
that we have in front of us? What kind of experiences do we want to have? Um, just from a place of gratitude, I'm looking at the camera directly into the audience's eyes that I am so happy that I was able to find something. Um, I would have found something no matter what I am, you know, an optimistic type of nihilist and where I will find, uh, you know, what makes me happy and what is core to my values. And I'm so happy that I found this space where I can not only talk about things that I think are interesting and funny and, you know, help in an activist type of way in reforming. Uh, just the ways that people interact with Mormonism would, and make it healthier for them to at least belong to. And then I'm just really grateful because I'm not always the best like articulator in like a life coachy kind of way. Um, but I love having these conversations because you know if I have to live one reality, I want to have a conversation about how we actually do life, like mm -hmm. actually do life, whether you're religious or not. It's kind of a big conversation. Like you're talking about with theology. It's like, how do we relate to matter to the you know, mysticism, to our past, to all of this stuff. This is what I want to be spending my time doing. This is what brings me the most happiness and um, personally and with my friends, with my family, and then as a content creator. So um, as we get into you know some of these tools that we offer, um, I wanted to share a quick story that I don't think I've ever shared before because I'm gonna start crying. Um, so uh, gratitude is a big one. And I think gratitude is one of those words I have to reintegrate. Like I said, that's the, the other thing is like, it has a little bit of a trigger, anything that reminds me of Mormonism or something I don't like, you know, yeah. just like, it well, cause we, in hokey. Mormonism, we use gratitude to stuff down feelings that we don't want to have. Right. So if you feel like you're being selfish or you feel whatever, it's like, be grateful. It's like push down any negative feelings or complaining and push that down by being grateful, which is like, yeah. that's not gratitude. It's just then our spiritual bypassing for, for trying to stop whining, which is like, yeah. why are we doing that? Exactly. Oh, I love talking about spiritual bypassing. That's like my other favorite subject to talk about as well. Cause I, um, you've talked about, uh, you know, things with psychedelics before. And as somebody who's dabbled in that realm before I, uh, you know, once you kind of go on a trip, you can't really expect much. You never really know where it's going to go. And I feel like because uh, so so many places I can go. Sorry, my ADHD brain is going all over the place. I think because, um, like you said, when Mormons <clears throat> like me, when you leave this one structure and you're kind of trying to look for the new, like, what is truth? What is this? What is all of this? And one thing that, you know, I turned to a couple of years ago was psychedelics. And there's a good part of that. There's also a bad part of that, of feeling like I went too far deconstructing, feeling like you were talking about, like, this is a hand in front of me, but you don't have any connection or like, you know, uh, grounding in like how the reality of it all. And so there's, there's a lot of positive things to that. And a lot of just breaking my reality, breaking it to smithereens where I am like ego dissolved. Don't give an F about anything that I ever need to do ever. But in within that there is a play and there is, um, signs of like gratitude is kind of what my trips have sometimes come back to me. And I mean, the darkest, darkest of times. So I had probably the biggest mental breakdown of my entire life in November. And, um, a friend over Thanksgiving was like, let's do, let's come over. We're going to go camping and, uh, we're going to do some totally legal substances. Don't get mad at me, YouTube. But anyway, was it um, Kyle? No, it wasn't Kyle. <laughs> Kyle is okay. my, uh, my, my bestest friend. And, uh, Britt, you're working on a course with Kyle Bishop right now of some kind, right? Are you working on a project Ky with me? Kyle and I are looking for a way to this conversation, everything that we've talked about in this conversation, yeah. how do we make a community of these people to be able to talk to each other and not feel crazy and share tools? So Kyle and I mm -hmm. have been trying to find a way to do that. And My uh, two favorite people. Oh my gosh. So it wasn't Kyle, Kyle point. Bishop, Beyond God and Religion. He's a good dude. Um, nope, another friend. And... I was in a, the darkest place of my life combined with, you know, mushrooms. And I went into kind of like a vision and I felt well, sometimes when I'm really tripping hard, I feel like I'm like in a wormhole of a, I can travel into my past. I feel like I am really straight up there. And, uh, 
whatever we want to believe about like metaphysics of if we can really travel to these things, I think it's helpful to um, at least interact with the possibility that, you know, you're able to move dimensions. And what does that mean? Even if I hold to that kind of loosely and the thing that I, that happened to me and I'm in the darkest stage of my entire life last November. And I woke up and I was like, where am I? And it was so real. And I was a, like a Mexican seven-year-old and I had a lot of teeth and I was in a playground with like a, a circle of a bunch of special needs kids. And I was one of those children that had perfect like cognitive function and stuff, but couldn't communicate. And, you know, I had a very like, yeah, what's the word? Um, uh, 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 differently abled body and had a very mal different shaped face and stuff with too much teeth in it and couldn't talk, couldn't communicate. And everyone was treating me like I was just a child, you know, but I was like an adult in, uh, in, a, in a person's body. And I was so sad. I got there and I was like, this is a reality that some people do live in. They can't communicate. They can't talk. They're talked down to. Nobody thinks they can do anything. They just sit and play in, you know, special needs classes for their entire life without being able to show what they can do, you know, without a voice whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, all right, I'm ready to go somewhere else now or whatever. And it was like, stay here for a while, get really bored, get like really frustrated, get really sad, get really like, this is a reality of a lot of fucking people. Like most people um, around the world do not have the voice that anybody mm -hmm. gives, that anybody listens to them, let alone, hey, Kara, just so you know, when you go pop back into that other reality, you have a husband who loves you. You have kids who love you. Baseline. You have a, you have friends. And you also have any time you want to turn on a camera and share an opinion, people will mm -hmm. listen to what you have to say. It is. It would have exploded the the reality of this 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 handicapped trial that I was in, the, of, of mm -hmm. the possibilities of what could happen in this universe, what the potential is. And I was like, the gratitude that just washed over me of like the darkest of of what my my actual reality is while also knowing how grateful I would be if I could swap lives, you know? Like if I was in that little Mexican child's body, no matter what I was going through, of course I would swap bodies with them. And so sometimes I feel like, yes, like that gratitude thing is like to shove down your your feelings um, that, are, that are not there. But then, you know, once you're really, you're feeling your feelings, you're there. But the now when I come back into reality, I am, I was so much more grateful to interact with the reality and the experiences that I wanted to have, knowing how rare of a shot this is in mm -hmm. life, that these conditions have come together and that I'm, I've taken a lot of chances up to this point to be able to have, you know, a platform and a family. I've taken a lot of chances and and acting so much on that, that just instinct of gratitude to just keep taking chances and keep taking chances. And that is kind of where the absurdism of, of where, um, has always kind of brought me back to a good center of like, it, it really doesn't matter. Just keep going with things that don't make sense. I know you, it doesn't make sense right now, but there's an absurdity and a play to it that you just keep doing what I've always done. And, uh, gratitude is one. One tool of moving yeah. into this absurdism. It it is a good tool, and one that I use. I have a different um, I have a different visualization that I do to get to that place because our brains are naturally neurotic, um, especially after motherhood. One of evolution's little gifts, uh, where oh, we really hyper focus. Yeah, we hyper fixate on negative things around us, things that we know that ultimately don't matter. We get bothered by it, whatever, and so we do have to have those little reminders or ways to get out of those neurotic thought loops. So for me, what I like to do to bring back that state of gratitude place is if I wake up and I'm especially grumpy that day, um, I do this meditation. It's actually from um, Noah Rochetta. Noah Rochetta has a podcast on this where he does a guided meditation on this. And I'll just kind of do it with myself where you imagine everything that you have, everything that you own, all the people that you know, uh, walking onto a stage and like in a line walking onto a stage. And then when they walk onto the stage, they disappear. And then at the end of 
you, I mean, you really go through everything, every possession that you have, all of your experiences, all of um, the people in your life, and you do this. And then eventually you walk onto the stage and disappear. Mm -hmm. And then, and it's kind of an exercise in just impermanence. And then you uh, start to come back where you walk off the stage into your life and then all the people in your life and all the projects and the sun is shining today and I can feel it on my skin and getting the mm -hmm. cup of coffee, all the things start to come back. And you realize in that moment, just like what you're saying is this is a lottery. Like mm -hmm. I get to stand up and walk. We get to speak into our microphones today and talk and we're resonating with each other. There's things that we will say that will make our bodies cry for, you know, some mysterious re reason and it's magic. And I have these people in my life and that's magic. And then I have, uh, I'm going to go make some lunch after this. And it, you know, when I make tacos, my body does a little like happy dance and that's magic. Mm -hmm. And then everything can become magic again, because you're in the experience state of being rather than uh, in the neurotic brain that's like, I really need to get this done today, blah, 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 mm -hmm. which just makes us suffer or I want this or this didn't happen the way that I wanted it to, blah, blah, blah. That's our natural kind of neurotic state. But those, those reminders of this is the lottery, experience is the lottery. If you have some way that you authentically can get there, then you can actually make that into your default state where you wake up and you are really living from the state of mm -hmm. what is there to experience today. And that's when life becomes more playful, more childlike. Uh, certainly you have, uh, it's easier to, to, to get through life because you're not sweating the small stuff as it were. And life can, can get a lot better. Someone in the comments is saying that this is, this is not new that Buddha discovered this 2,500 years ago. And I have a little bit of contestation with that where yes, in Buddhism, because when you watch your mind, you realize that you don't, you don't um, choose your next thought. You can through meditation, especially with Buddhism, really dissolve the idea that you're a self really watch your monkey mind really um, deconstruct free will. And yes, they have been doing that. And there is also some theology in, in Buddhism, things like uh, a re reincarnation or uh, there are very, there are many sects of Buddhism that make various truth claims, some of which stand up to modern science, especially neuroscience, a lot of which doesn't. And there's also patriarchy in Buddhism, a lot of patriarchy in Buddhism because uh, with Buddhism, you never really develop enlightenment that happens relationally. It's something that you do by yourself. It's something that you leave your wife and child for in order to sit under the Bodhi tree. And Buddhism, especially in, in early texts of Buddhism, will talk about how women are a barrier to enlightenment. And uh, we have writings is that because we're so sexy or why like family life it's, is a it's dream? really it's really that if you're if you want if you need to transcend your body because your body is limited and you have this you know monkey mind or whatever and you want to transcend it then uh and, and we get this with other forms of spirituality there's not a lot of embodiment in buddhism mm -hmm. where you are in your body where you are um you are awake when you're doing the dishes you are awake when you are uh, rocking your child at night. A lot of it is kind of escaping the body in order to kind of escape uh, the wheel of suffering. And so, yes, in Buddhism, you have some of these things where, where um, you know, they've deconstructed free will because they've watched the mind enough to realize that we don't have free will. But there's also, it's still a religion. It still has theology. If you go to a Buddhist country, there's a lot of superstition and um uh, you know, things that you wear for good luck. And if I uh, make this offering to the Buddha, he's going to help me with my business. You get the same prosperity gospel that you do in Christianity. You get the same kind of patriarchy problems that you get with Christianity. Female uh, monks have to do quite a bit more in order to be able to, to do that. Um, and so there sometimes we like to think in in the west that buddhism is just the answer but when you go to buddhist countries you you realize that uh there's still a lot of theology and superstition and patriarchy and the same problems uh we just don't see it here in the west because we have our western religions that take over a lot of that uh so i don't want to 
even though there are tools in Buddhism that we can take, and there's a lot in Buddhism that coincides with neuroscience in a way that other religions don't, I don't think we need to look at it in a way that like, oh, Buddhism has solved this. Uh, and it becomes this kind of, if you're in the West, you know, you think that it's a better functioning religion than all the other ones when there's still a lot, a lot of problems, just like with all religions and a lot of, a lot of, pain and suffering. I interviewed a woman who was, was abused and abuse, especially with the teacher student relationship with women is just really, really rampant and, and the spiritual and sexual abuse that happens with that. So yes, there are tools in Buddhism. No, it is not like a perfect escape where it's like, Oh, just be Buddhist. You avoid all of this. Not really, not really. Mm -hmm. They do, Most they good. do, yeah. they do do some good things as far as their ability to latch on to modern neuroscience in a way that like Christianity wouldn't, but it doesn't mean mm -hmm. that it's like a, a perfect thing that we can jump to because we keep trying to find like the perfect thing. Well, Buddhism is the path that avoids all of this. Well, there's not going to be, that doesn't exist. <laughs> mm -hmm. Organizations are always problematic. Mm -hmm. I think my favorite thing that I have picked up from Buddhism is obviously just like the simple idea of like, you know, what in my Mormon structure, it's like, if you're doing the right things, God will bless you and life will be good. He'll send challenges your way. He'll never give you anything that's too hard that you can't do. And it'll all be worth it in the end going into like, you know, chaos, structurelessness, meaninglessness, figuring out your own path and accepting that like life is pain. It's going to have pain. So within that, um, there's a saying that's like, you know, some people will say that, uh, like I went through this and I'm so glad that I did. I mean, there's other things that happened to you that you're like, that was just useless, meant nothing. And I'm just a changed tra traumatized person from that. And I've always kind of struggled with that idea, which you can tell me your thoughts on that. Uh, but all I know is like, whatever has happened, I've, I have accepted that like when I come out of feeling deeply like grief, sadness, the biggest feelings of life, Ultimately, I recognize how much deeper I can feel than I hadn't previously and how much better it is to feel because then moving forward, I am uh, the the game that I'm playing, the the actions that I'm taking are just more intentional and cause less harm to myself and others because I've been able to accept that I can go into that dark, dark, deep pain place and I will come out the other side and it's not the end of the world. Um mm. Uh, there's a comment that said, yeah, your comment section is wild. <laughs> is it good? I can't read everything right now. Well, uh, you get a lot of, um, more than I would have thought you get a lot of like, Joseph Christians? Smith is a liar. Read, read the Bible, read, you know, this guy read Exodus 33 and, yeah. and more than I would have thought, uh, for a deconstruction space. But we've, we've talked about that, about, Yes, that's an easy thing to do to jump from one re religion into another, but but we're, we're we have a different project you and I that we're trying to work on here. Yeah, no amount of telling Brit or me to just follow Jesus is going to work for either of us. And just like with Mormons, you know, I uh, like to say to Mormons if they say like you're making something up, you know that thing online where like you'll say something true about the temple and it's just because somebody hasn't mm. heard it before. They go, well, that's a lie. Like you're just lying for the sake of lying. Be like, just give me a little more credit that um, I'm going on the internet talking from my actual experience and what I actually believe. And uh, but it's it's true for Christianity too. There's yeah. a reason that atheists know their Bibles the best. There's a reason yeah. that atheists outperform Christians not even in just religion in general. So atheists and Jews know religion in general the best, but even even the Bible itself, atheists will outperform Christians on. And so uh, it's something that I get all the time of just like read the Bible. And it's like, mm, I have an almost doctorate degree from a Christian seminary. I've read the Bible yeah. a lot <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Have you and read the Bible? Have you read it? <laughs> and and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We're basically like we were talking about earlier that everybody will read their interpretations into the Bible. Everyone has yep. their own version of what the Bible says anyway. A thousand mm -hmm. different gods and everyone's and different the, minds. The more you read the Bible, the more you realize. And this is Dan McClellan's whole spiel is like there is right. not one message in the Bible that is consistent. There is mm -hmm. not one doctrine or version of God that is consistent in the Bible. When the people who actually study this document say, 
say it is very complicated. There are myths on top of translations, on top of myths, on top of oral traditions, uh, and it's just a big mess. And it's one of those kind of brain biases where if you think you know the Bible, you probably don't. And if you think it's really complex and messy and you don't know what to make of it, you probably have studied the Bible. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the way it is with anything. Mm -hmm. What's the, is it, it's not Kroger something. What is the name yeah, of that? Dunning-Kruger. The Dunning-Kruger effect. Yeah. Uh -huh. That you, the people who know, you know, right. Okay. Yeah. If you know, you know. <laughs> um, what do you think about this comment real quick? Hmm. Jacob said, that's exactly why I never uh, want my kids to have the notion of something eternal because losing it feels like the end of everything. And so I know that you've spoken at length mm. and written at length about Gen Z and people coming of age who probably are going to grow up in a system that has a lot less religion than we've been given. Um, so what is the benefits yeah. and the downsides I actually, I actually do agree with this statement that when we build up these fairy tales of life that are so much better than reality, right? When we say God is really loving and God is watching over you and, and the next life is unicorns and rainbows, uh, and that's how your brain is being built. You're being built on these fairy tales. When you lose the fairy tale, it's going to be more of an adjustment. It's going to be more, it's going to be harder for your brain. Uh, where uh, and so you essentially have two options with kids you can either shelter them and keep them in a fairy tale and really like like homeschool trad wife that project so that the nothing pops that bubble you can do that that's an approach and they will never have to face the harsh realities of life or you know you're either going to shelter them or help them be strong and so when you we do have some some evidence that shows that when you show that death is a part of life with young kids and it can be hard and they can cry. And and I remember the first time that my son realized that I'm going to die someday and he cried and I held him and I wanted a fairy tale mm -hmm. to tell him in that moment. And I couldn't. And so we just cried. Uh, it's hard. But as a 12 year old now he fully understands that he's going to die someday and he has limited time to do the things in life that he wants to do. And he seems like he's fairly well adjusted to that idea. And even just going out in nature, you know, we talk about in nature that uh, there's no room for new life if the old life doesn't die. There's no, there's no spring if there's no winter. And when we, when we talk about how we're a part of nature and that you get a turn to be alive and experience, and then one day your turn is over and the matter that was you gets to be reorganized into other things that get to experience life, uh, then they have some tool to realize that this is the natural order of things. And they seem to be able to cope with that better than if you're just learning that at 40 years old, that tends to be harder than when kids make sense of humans aren't separate from the natural cycle of life and death were a part of it. And, uh, kids are, kids are resilient. They can, they can face those things, uh, if we structure it and we we have those conversations and you know at the ages when they can handle and they tend to be able to cope and be able to accept that as as reality in the same way that you and i accepted mormonism as reality um but if you do the fairy tale game instead which is kind of like the shortcut like i you know i'm gonna die but i'm always gonna watch over you or i'm always gonna whatever uh, or I'm going to be in heaven and then you're going to be with me. It, it, it's like, it's like these empty calories. It's like this candy where someday it may not be enough. And then they're really going to be hurt because mm -hmm. they've never developed the skills to kind of face that death as a part of life. Mm -hmm. So I do, I do tend on the be as honest with your kids as is developmentally age wise appropriate. And I think that they can build the strength to, to handle that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So um, I have a couple questions. Is there anywhere you want to go in the conversation right now? We're at two hours. It's so fun. I probably have about a half hour or more. Okay. All right. So the natural question to that is then what is your answer to, you know, that big question of evil and what is the purpose of being good? What do we teach our kids to strive after? You know, what is that old Ben Shapiro and the very yeah. conservative thing of like, you can't build an ethical moral society with a mm -hmm. bunch of people who don't believe in God. 
Yeah, it, it's one that I it's one that I get a lot. So uh, as far as morality, oh sorry, I'm trying to lose my voice. Um, as far as morality, we we want objective morality. This is like what we do with God. We want this thing to exist, so we create the illusion that it exists. So we want objective morality so that we can say this is wrong and this is right, and we can build on this. And then there, I can make choices, and I won't have to spend so much time trying to figure out what's right and wrong because it's just black and white. It's there in the Bible, right? It says in the Bible what's right and wrong. It's like, no, it doesn't. There's not one consistent doctrine in the Bible. There's not one commandment in the Bible that God himself doesn't break. So the reality is we've always only had subjective morality. And we get our morality from two things. We get it from empathy and compassion, which we are social creatures and are, for the most of us, for the most part, we are born with that we as social creatures developed a capacity to um, feel what others feel and to be able to resonate and understand what people are going through. And this is not unique in primates. Other primates uh, show signs of compassion and other animal species have moral codes for their, for whatever helps them to, you know, in, in their groups. So for, for example, mice, if, if, mice need to practice a lot of play as they're developing. And if someone is being, a, if there's a rat that's being a bully and they don't lose at least 10% of the time, then they will be kicked out of rat society. No rat Jesus, no rat Moses. They just do it because it's not fair. They have a sense of fairness that like you're winning too much and you're not allowing me the ability to practice fighting here. They do that all on their own. Primates show uh signs of justice too. So we are born with our a sense of morality and compassion and empathy and religion actually stops that process by saying actually we do good because this is what God tells us to do and then you'll be rewarded. When mm -hmm. we do that, we actually lower our capacity to act from compassion because it all the only thing that matters is that Santa is watching us at all times and able to give us presence if we're good. And we see that even with studies of atheists versus Christian children is that Christian children are more likely to be judgmental and less moved by compassion than atheist children. Mm -hmm. So we what's have that, that saying, now. what's yeah, that saying? Ahead. That's like, you can get, a, uh, you can't get a immoral person to do a moral person to do immoral things, but you can get oh, like, yeah, a religious yeah, person yeah. to do immoral things. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me get it. Um good people do good things, bad people do bad things. To get a person, a good person to do a bad thing, you need religion. There you go. There it is. I was the night I became an atheist. I was <laughs> I was going through a lot of stuff and that one hit me and yeah. deep in my heart. And I was like Which is true. When you look at when you look at the FLDS church and how the mothers will drop off their 15, 16 year old son at a gas station at the border and drive away. Only religion can do that. Only mm -hmm. religion can say this is the right thing to do because that co-opted a mother's love for her child. Mm -hmm. And the mother would not have done that without religion. So mm -hmm. yeah, there is a point to that. The other thing that we have is conversation. So for example, I wasn't always an LGBTQ ally. I, you know, I was Mormon. I wasn't I wasn't always, uh, I didn't, I didn't understand a lot of things. It didn't, some things didn't make sense to me. And, and this is, you know, where, where John DeLynn obviously has made some hit, made some headway. When you listen to enough stories about people's experience, it changes you. So the mm -hmm. only morality we ever have had is our natural capacity for empathy and compassion and conversation. And those two together are the best that we have. The more we're in conversation with each other and understand how we hurt and help each other and how that matters, and the more that we're guided by our own empathy and compassion, the better our morality is. The problem with God is, you know, there's there's another famous phrase that without God, you can do anything. But we find in the world that the opposite is true. With God, you can do anything. If you believe that God is on your side, you can strap a bomb to your chest and feel like it's the right thing. In the secular world, it's harder to do that. It's harder to say, uh, I'm going to cause a massive amount of suffering 
and it's the right thing to do Mm -hmm. because we have the science that says, no, this shows that people suffer. You're making people suffer and Mm -hmm. you can negotiate with that and we can have rule of law and we can separate for you from society. Even with sociopaths or psychopaths who don't have natural empathy and compassion, you either have to, in order to play in the playground with the rest of us, you either have to act with compassion and empathy uh, in order to play with the rest of us, or we need to separate you from society because, because people will suffer, uh, mm-hmm. if you are na- are not able to act in this way. Mm-hmm. So with, with, um, rule of law in the secular world and being able to reason and being able to have conversations and being led by compassion really is our best chance for a moral system. When we add God to the mix, what happens is we rape in the name of God. We pillage in the name of God. This land is God's favorite and Like no one can tell me that having a God in the Middle East is making the war easier and better and more moral, that God has commandments and has this holy book over here and this holy book over here. No one can tell me that that is making the Middle East a more moral place. It's actually making it far worse because you can do whatever you want to do in the name of your God. So uh, we do have to be aware of, you know, political religions and people will always say, well, what about Stalin and what about Pol Pot? And what about these, you know, atheist secular things? And it's like, those aren't, those aren't secular societies that are being driven by empathy and conversations. Those are just religions. Those are dogmatic religions, but instead of a God at the top, it's Stalin. So it's acting Mm -hmm. like a religion. It has a narrative. Stalin, the Eastern Orthodox church still paints halos on, pictures of Stalin. It's that, that was a religion. That's not a, a secular world being driven by conversation. That the mm-hmm. problem of that, uh, of that regime was not because it was conversing too much. Mm-hmm. So I, I do think our only way of having morality is we have empathy and compassion. Suffering is bad. Our actions matter in the world and conversation. That's the best mm-hmm. we've got. Yeah. Um, on that conversation point, you know, I, the way that you just described things that are just dictatorships, religions overall, they're mostly they're dictatorships. And that's my, my biggest problem with religions or anything that is just has a dogma to it. Now that I have also moved from being like very conservative, I was listening to Ben Shapiro and Gavin McGinnis every day to being a lefty over here now. Um, and people say, you know, you left one religion for the other. And I was like, I started with my name Nuance because I I understand dogma and I really um, I don't want to be subject to somebody else's authoritative take on something ever again. And that's where conversations come in and empathy and understanding, being able to play out both sides. And that can really Mm -hmm. only happen if we are um, truth seekers who are going after as much information as possible. Like you've been talking about also recognizing our cognitive biases, recognizing how our brains play into this. And when you take religion out of it, it does a lot of the heavy lifting and work to say, I can't always just trust my thoughts. You know, when you're religious, you're like, you're a lot more trusting that these thoughts are from God and move forward with them. But Mm -hmm. I'm really grateful to be in a space now where as complicated as things are, realizing how um, beneficial it is to know as much as we know about the brain versus what I was told about my feelings, meaning something, acting on them. And you build an entire society around authoritative feelings or outsourcing those to somebody else who's, you know, they say that their feelings, their ideas, their political motives are, you know, the supreme motives of the creator of the universe. That's not a moral system whatsoever. That doesn't, that's not democratic. That doesn't take, uh, you know, everybody on planet earth's, you know, inherent well-being and worth into account. So um, I definitely agree with you on that. And uh, it was actually one of the big topics in Ben Ben Shapiro debated uh, Alex O'Connor, famous atheist. He's really young, this this young kid. And they were debating, obviously, you know, can we have morality without God? And of course, Ben Shapiro uh, was, was doing a lot of work to try to say that if you You know, because Alex O'Connor was saying, if someone comes to me and says, I'm going to kill you in in the name of God, there's not really anything that you can say. But if someone says, I'm going to kill you uh, and you're in a secular world, well, now you have some law. You can call the police. Maybe you can talk to this person. Maybe you can uh, try to find a way not to have this person kill you. 
whereas someone who believes in God, there's nothing you can really do at that point. And Ben Shapiro's argument against that was saying that, well, who's more likely to try to kill you, someone who believes in God or someone who doesn't? And Ben Shapiro's argument is that um, without God, there's going to be more people who just go around murdering. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to know for sure, but that's, that's an interesting claim that to say that people who don't believe in God are just going to walk around being murderers when religious violence is just so obvious, you know, crusades mm -hmm. in the name of God. Uh, there's a commentary saying, I'd love to see some stats on that one. And I would too, because he started to argue that way and he got some real big pushback from Alex O'Connor saying, I'm not sure that that's true. Um, but it, it, it almost is true for someone who's religious, who has never had to do their moral system just based on their empathy mm -hmm. and compassion from the time that they were a child. So mm -hmm. maybe someone coming from religion thinks, well, if there's no rule, if there's no, it, it, it's almost like telling kids be good because the teacher is watching you on this camera all the time. So they be mm -hmm. good. And then they're 40 years old and you say, actually, no one's behind the camera. No one's watching you. Yeah, there may be mayhem, but it's because you set up a system where mm -hmm. that's what's going to happen with their morality. If you mm -hmm. built a system saying, actually, we all have feelings. And when you bullied that kid, it hurt their feelings. And we're going to go talk to them. You can actually not have that experience at 40 where I'm just going to do whatever I want. Um, because that's the way that you've built your moral system. So anyway, it's an interesting yeah. conversation that we're trying to figure out as, as the West is becoming more secular, how do we do morality, but hopefully with better science, uh, more conversation, the fact that you and I can just be talking now, which we couldn't have 50 years ago, hopefully we can keep our, our moral compasses and our moral code and build a more moral world than we did with God. Yeah. And the only thing I would add to that is, um, I have seen a lot of dark sides of people who are not religious whatsoever. And so as the nuance, though, the only thing I would add to that is like some people who do operate a little bit in a more selfish nihilist way who you're like, they're like, I didn't ask to be born. I am here. And generally I'm out for me. Like that does exist. That um, does exist. Absolutely. And I think I we think, see it most with the Columbine shooters. Yeah. When yeah. you when you read their journals, they're very much nihilistic. And the best thing that you can do is take yourself out of the system and as many people as you can with you. Mm -hmm. So it, ex it exists. It is yeah. a real thing. The question that everybody's asking is, what's more dangerous, fundamentalism mm -hmm. or nihilism? And we actually really don't know. We know how bad fundamentalism is. We know what religious wars can do, but we've never had a full generation of nihilists. We don't really know what that looks like on a grand scale because we've mm -hmm. never had it before. So some people are afraid of, uh, this would be jo Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro talk about this a lot of, of we've never had this before. It's possible that that we're leaving God, but we're going to become so nihilistic and cold towards one another that, um, you know, the world's going to turn into actual hell and it's going to get worse. And then some people, you know, the Sam Harris types are more optimistic that if we can get away from God, maybe we can make the world a place where there's less suffering. And we actually don't know. We don't know the answer to that. We don't know what's going to be more dangerous. Both are dangerous. That that does exist. But which one's more dangerous? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I would say, <clears throat> I, I want to ask you kind of what kind of it, along that theme, what kind of world would you hope for? And my answer, I'll go first, is I spend a lot of time on TikTok and I listen to a lot of therapists and things. And I'm very much in the space of, you know, people getting to work on their trauma. I just listened to the book that, by Oprah and another very smart person. And I wish I knew his name because I love him so much. Um, the book, uh, What Happened to You? And a lot about, you know, starting from a place of where our traumas come from and how it plays out in our lives and how throughout ha humanity, communally, how we have healed those traumas and um, how we kind of get to work. And another one of my favorite books is called Tribe on Homecoming and Belonging. And um, I, I'm in this space so much where I'm personally healing from different traumas, trying to understand people in the world and why they do harmful things, not because they believe in a God, but because, you know, they they um they just haven't quite gotten to work on their own traumas myself included you know just when you act unconsciously out of a place of you know uh, this this kind of thing happened to me and it 
makes me, you know, discount the how I would say um, the the blind spots, you know, that we all have. And so the world that I kind of try to look for is people who care about uh, causing less harm and less, less trauma to kids, especially, and giving our kids the happiest, healthiest place to grow up in that, you know, forwards the the least amount of baggage and trauma that if we don't take care of ourselves, that's, it's like a very conservative principle that I, I, I had when I was conservative, I worked for a very conservative nonprofit where it was all about, you know, parents dealing with their shit and not putting the baggage onto kids. And that's still a principle that's core to who I am today. It's part of the reason my husband and I were going to get divorced a couple times last year. And it was like, we have, we, we have work to do and we can do it together. We absolutely can do it together. And there's no reason um, that we need to put any of this stuff we couldn't figure out onto our kids. And I just feel like um, in this space to a world that I would want to create as a type of secular atheist is people who um, are just conscientious of their actions, their blind spots, their traumas, and want to get to work on them and can be able to hold themselves through them that you're not a terrible person for doing terrible things or, you know, not measuring up, just going through life, loving all the different parts of you, incorporating the shadow and the good, the bad, everything that is once labeled one way and just having it all um, kind of form into a new uh, person and identity that is a, a type of consciousness that you're comfortable swapping out lenses and moving through life with and, you know, being very comfortable with loving ourselves and not, you know, shaming one another and hating the things that we see in others because we uh, we have a trigger wound of something that that's within ourselves. So that's kind of my my aspect on a on a small scale of how I I try to live my life, and I would encourage people to just you know read the books like What Happened to You or get to work on on the small things to give yourself meaning and purpose. But um, Britt, what up? In your opinion. How do we build a better world as a bunch of secular atheists? Yeah, I, someone asked me this question, you know, what, because I, I deal in many spaces in religion and spirituality of like, what, what are you wanting here? What do you want? Because uh, I don't want everything that has been housed in religion to go away. I, even as a secular atheist now, if I go, if I go to a different place, if I'm traveling, I want to go to wherever their temple was, wherever was their sacred place, right? I don't, I don't want all this. I don't want all the sacredness of what it means to be human to go away. And so the, the image that I came up with that I think I'll go with here is I just kind of imagine us at a, at a big table and everybody has a gift. The Buddhists have worked with the mind more than anyone else. And they have meditation techniques for us. Um, and the Hindus can talk to us about the sacredness of all life and that all life has value. And the Jains will talk, uh, talk to us about peace and, and nonviolence is, is really what they have to offer. And the Christians can talk to us about Jesus and how to live a simple life, a non-materialistic life, uh, a selfless life, a connected life. And there's times where you go into the wilderness and, and that life is about love and service and loving outside of your tribe. This is what we get from Christianity. And the Jews have been having a conversation about religion longer than anyone. And they've secularized better than everyone because they've had to lose so many truth claims along the way that they've been able to keep their culture without a lot of the truth claims. You can be a secular atheist. You can be or a, a secular Jew, you can be an atheist Jew, and more than any religion, they've been able to do that. Uh, and the Muslims have some beautiful work with text, and and I have a, I mean, I'm actually a Sufi, an ordained Sufi, which is the mystic branch of Islam, and some beautiful language for levels of your soul and parts of your soul that help me to understand myself. And everybody has some some sacredness and some truths and some tools and some gifts and some culture and some meaning and, and, and food and rituals. And we all kind of share this at the table of what it means to be human. And when one person in the group says, actually though, we have the real God and we're going to murder all of you. <laughs> and you have to, you have to participate in our religion or you're going to go to hell. And, and we start playing that game. We all go, no, 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 no. We used to do that. We've done that before. We don't do that anymore. We almost killed, like at, at some point, fundamentalism is going to become so damaging. Someone's going to get a nuclear weapon. Like we're going to kill ourselves if we keep doing that. We don't do that here anymore. Uh, 
And when someone says, I want to die because life is too much suffering, there's tools at this table. Like you said, like you just want a place where people can be human and heal and be able to play and experience and not experience and not and where children can grow up without trauma. And so we all share our tools so that you don't have to feel like you want to die or you don't, you don't have to feel so much suffering. And I want both of those things. I, I want that table with all of the best of what religion and spirituality and tools and deep humanness and, and psychology. And, and I want all the good things to be shared at the table so that we don't have people in nihilism that are killing themselves. But I don't want any one of those religions to become so toxic and, and the sexual abuse and the spiritual abuse and the religious crusades and we can't even do some science because maybe uh, those stem cells have a soul and, and, and we're getting so complex. We can't even agree what is reality. So we can't even solve modern problems because we're all sold on our superstitions and we have to stop doing that too. And so I want, I, I want that table and I want it so that when one religion or way of life starts to become so dogmatic and unhealthy, that the world can say, we don't do that anymore. Mm. It's not okay. We don't, that's abuse and it's not okay. And that's what mm -hmm. I hope for the world. A new earth, Eckhart Tolle. <laughs> something, yeah. something else we are evolving to as a species because we have access to, um, like we we're born with this compassion and this empathy and now we have access to more stories and more information. And so what is the species gonna evolve, in, evolve into? That's... I would, I would say some people are very optimistic that, that this is something that we can do because we have enough technology and, and awareness of, of the human condition and, and to, you know, awareness of what's going on in the world that they're optimistic. I gotta say, if you were to, if you were to make me put money on this, I don't think this is a fight that secular morality, uh, humanists are going to win. I think that Colting is so strong in our brains mm -hmm. that I, and not just that, but religions are always going to produce more children than secular people will. And they're always going to mm -hmm. produce stronger communities, tight knit communities to raise those children. So even if you're just looking at the math, this may be a battle that you and I are going to lose. You know, we'll build our new nonprofits and we'll do our work and we'll do it anyway because we care about it. And it's a project we want to do. But I will say that even if I could know that religion is going to some religion is going to get some nuclear bombs and blow up the world in 20 years, I would still do this because it's a mm -hmm. battle worth fighting because I got to have some freedom, because I got to be in a place where you and I could have conversations like this. And um, I got to experience life outside of Mormonism and I got to help others experience that life, too. And all of that is valuable just for that project even if our brains are not going to let us uh, break away from some of our culting and superstitions mm -hmm. and, and dogma. I mean, look at us. We're neat. You and me, we're not dumb. Like we're not dumb people. And we were very in with Mormonism. Like we were in, we believed it. And it took a long time to deconstruct. And you and I are privileged that we have the tools to mm -hmm. be able to do that. Most people don't have that. Yeah. So this may be a battle that we lose, but it's a battle worth fighting anyway. Mm -hmm. Right on. And I have to say, if it's going to be a battle, I want to make it a fun one. I want to make it with silliness and humor. <laughs> and uh, going back to what we were talking about, you know, if this is life and what do I want to experience kind of in the now, um, I hope that people are in the chat and in the comment section, please do not go to the whole like eat, sleep and or eat, drink and be merry because um, some people live like that. I'm sure you could find them. That's not who me and Brit are. So that's that argument does not hold any water in this discussion. But in terms of, you know, the battle, I, uh, I try to make things as happy in these experiences I can. And um, really, uh, I had a a really rough couple of years in this space. I'm very optimistic, very happy person. I'm really happy to be doing what I do, but I also want to be very balanced and I'm not very good at being balanced. And so part of my like, you know, 
this battle is, I don't ever want it. John Larson, you know, he just kind of retired from doing his contract with Mormon stories and stuff. And he had this last episode and he talked about, uh, our last thing that he put on his channel, um, about being in this space for a long time and not wanting to, you know, be fighting in this, this battle anymore. Cause it's always going to go on. It's like politics. Mm. There's always going to be something. There's always gonna be something on the news. And so how do I healthily engage in something that I think is important and feel like I'm good at and people want from me. And that, that comes with balance and not feeling like it's the end of the world that I have to sacrifice yeah. myself. Doing to it, do it. Play. like I, I do my TikToks, not because I think like I'm going to convert a Christian to an atheist today, because mm -hmm. if I did that, I would burn out. And what would be the point of all of that? But if I do it because I enjoy it and this is how I play, mm -hmm. this is how I connect, then mm -hmm. it becomes a well where you're not burning out. And because mm -hmm. it's, it's how you and I are expressing and connecting in the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, we'll never see the, the completion of any kind of like battle or signal or like the end, like Mormonism isn't going to shut its doors in our lifetime and, and everything's yeah. going to go away. And so it's just kind of you know, how we want I will to say I kind of still of everything that I still like have to mourn, like we have to mourn a lot of things. I mourn that we don't get to know how it ends. That still hurts me. Like that's still a wound for me that I will sometimes cry about that, that, we're so involved in this story. I, I was a history teacher before I got into the work that I do now. And, and so I, I know a lot about the human story, um, or at least have had the opportunity to study what the human story has been. Um, and to, to be a curious mind like mine is, and to see a lot of the beginning of the story and the middle of the story and the story mm -hmm. that I'm in now, and not know how that story ends. I, I I still mourn that. That's still sad to me. That's that's mm -hmm. a hard truth to me. So I, I'm engaging in the chapter of the human story that I'm in, but I do wish I could see how it ends. Mm -hmm. For me, I just know that at some point, I am going to assume I'm going to be an old lady in a bed and I have three kids. And if I don't center, you know, my my life around, like, I want to be able to look back at, you know, 90 years of life and be like, there's my kids, there's my grandkids. And that's, that's all I really ever want to say that I ever accomplished. And I sound like a Mormon woman when I talk like that, but it, that's, that's the, the reintegration of something that I kind of pushed away for a while where I didn't want to concentrate on that as much. And I wanted to be, you know, more involved in things that were, cerebral and mm -hmm. conversations and, and, and more developing myself and my personality and stuff. And one of the integrations that I've come back to is like, that's me, that's me. That's, that yeah. is me, me, me. And, um, because I haven't been able to always uh, put that at the <laughs> forefront, it's actually helped me back a lot from, um, actually engaging with the true parts of myself. Um, cause anytime, you know, there's something in the shadow or it'll come out in other unhealthy ways. So I'm just like, the story I will end where I look back at my life and I'm really happy that um, I faced challenges, I overcame them. That's yeah. all I know. That's all I know that I'll be able to say for sure about my life. I do think that's a healthy like circle that we make as Mormon women is like this special, this certain kind of femininity is like shoved down our throats. You're only a mother and you're only mm -hmm. this and whatever. And then for a while we reject that. And like, we need to build a self, like we need to figure out who we are. We need to be selfish a little bit. Uh, Cause we never got that, got that chance. Or sometimes we regret having children because we feel like we were forced to, especially before mm -hmm. we knew who we were and we can mourn that. And, and there's a lot of that going on, but then, you know, you almost come back to a kind of femininity in a new way that there's something really sacred um, about, about being a mother, something mm -hmm. really, really deeply sacred. And that I have that same thing in my life of, when I tell my children on my deathbed that I love them, I want to live my life today so that they believe that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <sighs> love you. I could, um, I could ask you two more questions or we could wrap up right now. How are you feeling? Uh, give me one. Okay. Uh, um, I have two ones I have to, how do I pick from them? Let's talk about the most important thing that I is a, so spiritual bypassing mm. um we haven't gotten to a whole lot of stuff about secular spirituality so that's my biggest most interesting focus um and things that have to do with ego 
and kind of making a new God for ourselves and a new model for ourselves. And I think uh, spiritual bypassing is something that a lot of religious people and, you know, secular spiritual people do as well. People who are not spiritual at all, they there's a bypassing highway that we all take. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I definitely agree that we all do this. And the only way that you not do that, it, it's like, it's like that thing that everyone is sexist and racist, the only or biased or whatever you want to say, the only people who aren't are the people who know what their bias is or know the ways that they're, mm -hmm. they, they've internalized sexism or whatever. So we all do spiritual bypassing. Uh, it's essentially we all do emotional bypassing, which is we do little things in our brain to not feel feelings that we don't want to feel. When it's spiritual bypassing, it's we're using something in spirituality to feel things that we don't want to feel. And so this happens in, in religion, obviously, but it's really rampant in new age spirituality too. And so what I see is the Christianity or Mormon to witch pipeline is like a straight line, right? Because uh, especially for women, it's a way to gain spiritual autonomy, which has been taken in patriarchal religions. And I get that. But that world is also rampant with spiritual bypassing of not having to like, you know, you, you don't have to take accountability for your actions. You can be an asshole today because Mercury's in retrograde. I did, mm -hmm. I did a TikTok on the eclipse and kind of cataloged look at all the spiritual bypassing going, going on in religion and new age spirituality and tarot horoscope astrology land. Um, that is really about like, Hey, are humans acting weird today? Is your mood a little off today? It's because of the eclipse, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, we're doing the same thing where it's like, you're, you don't have to be responsible for yourself. You don't have to feel things. You don't have to look inside because there's a way to bypass that. Oh, the planets are doing this and that's why this happened, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it's rampant in all forms of spirituality because we we just want something to help us not feel what we're avoiding feeling. So as far as secular spirituality, what, what helped me so much and is helping many Mormons in this space is that when you've been burned by religion, you're skeptical of spirituality in general. When you learn about spiritual bypassing, you see it now everywhere. And then you don't want to engage with in spirituality at all because it just looks like this woo place, this Kool-Aid that everybody's drinking that has hurt you in the past and you don't want to drink it anymore. So the reason that secular spirituality is so powerful is it says, here is the science on what rituals do. We have solid data that shows that something like rituals uh, helps mark your values helps process emotions out of your body, increases pleasure and decreases pain. We know that it does this. And so when you get the science of um, rituals, then you can say, oh, there's something here. There's something happening underneath all of this, you know, all of the woo truth claims in and out of religion. As someone said in the comics, Tika, TikTok is the Mecca of Kool-Aid spirituality. I totally agree. Uh, but it gives me lots of stuff to stitch all the time, which is fun for me. Um, and so what we can do is get down to the base of like, what is actually happening here with awe and transcendence and love and community uh, and rituals? What is the science of what's going on? And when you get enough science there to say there's something here, then you can walk into this space and get this tool without having to play woo games that you can't do anymore because you have too much religious trauma and you just can't, you can't do it. And so secular spirituality is just a really safe space to start. Some people just call it spicy psychology or the science of well-being. It's very similar mm -hmm. to the, to Yale's course on the science of happiness. It's just getting down onto the science of what helps you, uh, you know, what is the data says helps humans move towards well-being so that they're self-reporting, that they're happy, that they have meaning, that they have good relationships, they have good health, they have good mental health, that they have good longevity, uh, they live with less regrets. What are the things that, what are the tools that that the, that points in that direction? What is what is going on in our brains when we're when we're praying, when we are doing manifestation games with the universe, whatever we're doing. And then when you can get to the tool, the science underneath it, then you can find a way to integrate that in your life in an authentic way without having to believe something that you just can't believe anymore because you you're too skeptical because uh, you've been burned by religion. So secular spirituality is a great place to start. 
uh, to get some of these tools. It was really helpful for me because we did, we're separating the tool from the woo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, uh, absolutely applaud the work that you do and explaining these types of concepts. Most of what I do, if I had like one sentence of why I do what I do, it's to give people back this autonomy and this intuition that's like, no, this was, this was always yours. There's power here in these things um, that they're just innate to you and outsourcing this intuition and this power um, for so long. It's like we've talked about, it's had its benefits for our evolution, but for me, Kara Burrell, it's not healthy in Mormonism. It's not healthy outside of Mormonism to, um, to completely shove off everything that has ever interacted in a religious space that's ever caused me trauma. Yes. And, uh, I can, yes. I can actually feel more empowered by using the best tools, the best psychology. So love that. Yeah. I love this comment in the comment section comment section. Thank you. That's why astrology has not felt good for me lately. I'm so happy to have words to describe it. This is why I like talking about this because I never, as a, as a, as an ex-Mormon, this is going to be my, this is going to be my, uh, trauma wound for the rest of my life. I never want someone to have to believe something that they're not feeling good about, that they're not resonating with, that they're having to turn off their rational brain in order to get a tool that's helpful for them. So if this person was in um, was in a session with me, we'd be trying to figure out uh, what is it about astrology that's a helpful self-reflection tool and how can we focus on that better? Because there's a part of you that's really not resonating with this and having a hard time with some of the truth claims around this, or maybe there's some spiritual bypassing happening, or maybe you're feeling like you have to turn off your rational brain. Um, we don't have to do any of that for spiritual tools. We don't have to mm -hmm. do that. We don't have to do that in Mormonism. We don't have to do that with tarot. There are tools there. Can we get the tool without the beliefs that uh, just really cut us off from part of ourselves? Just like when we mm -hmm. are Mormon and, and trying to make the mental gymnastics work, we don't have to do that. That, that mm -hmm. would be my mission. We don't have to do that anymore. Well said. And so that kind of leads into our wrap up about you, how you have a book coming out on April 22nd, right? I do. I'm very excited. It's called No Nonsense Spirituality, All the Tools, No Faith Required. And it's it's just what I talked about in that last sentence. How can we get the tools without having to believe things? And it doesn't mean that I know that there's no God or I know that there's no afterlife or I know what's going on with reality. It's yeah. really a kind of spirituality that we can build while admitting we don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Can I get some tools anyway? I don't know mm -hmm. if I can believe this. Can I have the tool anyway? Mm -hmm. And so the chapters are things like ordering chaos, rituals, on contemplation, awakening the feminine, meaning and purpose, um, secular morality, which we talked about, intuition and the occult, mysticism, wisdom, traditions, community, love, story, human flourishing and the future of spirituality. And I really do it. And at the end of each chapter is some self-reflection questions that you can do in a book group or by yourself to really uh, start to build a spiritual path that reflects you, that helps you build an authentic life that's worth experiencing. Mm. I'm excited to share that with you all. And I, I hope Yay. I can have your support. Yay. So where can people find it? Where will it be available? Is there an audiobook? Uh, there's not an audiobook yet. There'll be a Kindle and paperback version on Amazon. And on April 22nd, I'll be live with John DeLynn and live on TikTok. Maybe you and I can hop on live for a little bit on TikTok that day too. And uh, just talking about it and answering some questions. And hopefully I'm just able to share some tools that have helped me turn my life from one that I didn't want to live to one that I'm really enjoying existing in. Oh, you are the knight in shining armor you've been waiting for. Night test. Right. <laughs> the night. This is where the I want to do the Lord of, of the Rings. I am no man. Mm -hmm. Just... Um, well, you know, kingdom of God. Are you is not within. a Lord of the Rings nerd? I am. But uh, you were giving me nothing. I I, I did. I sorry. I gave a you beautiful nothing. Beautiful analogy. I have. Um, I was trying to think of maybe something like she's the man or something else. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> sorry, that was great. That was a great integration of something from my Mormonism that I was really into. It's uh, <laughs> more of like a Legolas. Like I had my mm. eyes fixated on my mm. heterosexuality. I wasn't concentrated with what the women were up to. Impure, yeah, you're yeah. thinking some impure thoughts. 
Mm-hmm. About what you'd like to do with Legolas. <laughs> yeah, I had a a man pillow that I made in eighth grade. If you want to know how my Mormonism oh, was going, oh, you're for real. I, I I made all the hottest men and I mm. sewed her and I I uh, stitched them onto a pillow and then I did it for a young woman's activity where we all put on hot men on our pillows. We had a very progressively strange board and I slept on a picture uh-huh. of Legolas every night. So uh-huh. trust me, I love your your. Okay, uh, <laughs> all right, I'll let it slide. All right. Um, I could not be happier with how this discussion went. Um, I cried. I've laughed. I felt whole again. We'd seen it again and again. Everybody in the chat has um, really been loving it too, except for the Christians. Sorry, guys. (laughs) But uh, thank you guys for uh, sticking with us in this. And if you guys are interested in getting more of Brittany, uh, where can they find you? No nonsense on all the platforms, basically. No the nonsense. links are in the bio as well, but and or, sorry, on all the platforms. Question. And I do spend my most of my time on on TikTok that way. Uh, and then, yeah, I have some courses. Also, if you want to do this uh, with a course, that I have a course on religious deconstruction. I have a course on spiritual reconstruction, which will give you some of the options and help you rebuild and recreate. I have a course on nihilism, which are my ten. Uh, best tools that I use with clients who are kind of stuck in the space. I do have some coaching slots, uh, but I'm not able to do as much of that as the demand. So if you're not able to get a coaching space, I do try to put all of my tools into my courses so that that's an option as well. Everybody go to Brittany's website. It's no nonsense religion.com. No nonsense spirituality.com. No, no nonsense re- spirituality. I have yes. it in the description below, wherever you're watching this or listening to this, it'll be down below right now. And uh find the link to how people watch the speech that you gave, also kind of about patriarching your your uh spirituality. It'll change your life. Everybody at Thrive, standing ovation, tears a lot of what you saw with me doing today, but like 300 people. <laughs> so Brittany, you're amazing. Thank you so much for being my friend and Thank sharing you so much. all of your I, I'm not, I'm not picking you up by saying this is one of my favorite conversations that I've had. Mm. And I do a lot of podcasts and to be honest, a lot of the times, you know, they are with, with men and, and we were able to get into some motherhood spaces in regards to nihilism yeah. that I usually don't get into, be able to get into. Yeah. And you and I, you know, I can be spicy on, on TikTok because I, I get a lot of people telling me to go to hell and I'll play with that. And you can get yeah. spicy on social media, but we were able to get to some um, really deep and, and sacred places today. And I'm just really grateful for this conversation. I had an amazing time. You said in your speech that spirituality is whatever you want it to be. This is a spiritual mm-hmm. conversation. Absolutely. Was this, was, this was a three hour church and I loved it. And I'd come back. <laughs> mm-hmm. We did our own three hour block. We did. Here. Yeah. And was that not like, you know, we went to church for years and years and years. And just the three hour conversation that we had was more food for my soul than all the years of ch- all the three hour church blocks that I've ever done because, yeah. because it was human, you know, like we mm-hmm. got to go to some human places that sometimes we don't, we aren't able to do when we're our snarky TikTok selves. So mm-hmm. uh, I love conversations. I loved this conversation and I really love the work that you're doing. Thanks. Hug it out. Thank you so much. And um, last thing I'll leave you guys with before I let you go. Just know that there is a subscribe button. If you haven't hit it yet, please do. Liking this video is always amazing. But I do run a nonprofit now. It's called the Nuance Hug Foundation. And I'm trying to be donor funded. And as much as I can, I just have to kind of say there's donate buttons below. And these conversations can keep going. This podcast can keep going. And speaking of wanting to live life for the experiences, Britt, did you know I'm taking off the summer to go work at a summer camp with my kids? So I was like, that's Ooh, what I want to do. I want to take a break cool. and Look at you. go be in the forest with my kids. So I'll be taking the summer off from June to love August. That. But when I get back, yeah, August 26th is I'm trying to put together an ex-Mormon group trip. So all of this space, I want to be able to be sustainable for a long time. That's where donors help out. But if you are in a financially feasible place listeners and uh want to come join my group trip we're going to greece on august 26th for seven days athens santorini i'll be doing a lot of other smaller things throughout the year and throughout the rest of my lifetime probably but if you want to help you know just support your girl with donations that's available to keep this podcast going but if you want to actually do something and get off the screens and interact 
and go on a yacht in the Mediterranean with me for five days. Got 24 spots and there's payment plans. Links are down in my description below. So let me, let me say one thing. August. One of the most powerful ways that we can combat bad religion in the world is right now we're in this game where the religions, because of their dogma, they get 10% income from people because the dogma drives money and resources and time and people. And so the people who are outside of religion, trying to give people spiritual tools that mm -hmm. are not based on uh, dogma and spiritual authority, yeah. uh, often we have to do it without money, without pay. There's, yeah. you know, I, I do a lot of, we, we all have to do a lot of this work without pay. And so, mm -hmm even though it's hard sometimes to ask for financial support because it can feel icky or you can feel like you're a Mormon asking for tithing. Something that helped change my mind is that there's no way that we can make spirituality better outside of religion if we're not contributing financially to the causes and voices and people that are helping us in this space mm -hmm. or else religion wins just out of the gate because it has money and the other people who are trying to do this work have day jobs and are just doing this on the side. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the most powerful things that, that you can do to combat bad religion and support more conversations that are helpful are to maybe not 10%, but I really try to, instead of being a Mormon and giving 10% to my church, I really try to at least give 5% of my income to the voices and people and causes that I care about in the world. Yeah. And that really is necessary if we're going to change the world. And so if you've yeah. enjoyed this conversation, if you enjoy watching Nuance Ho and want her to be able to continue this work, uh, definitely donate and check out what she's doing. And if you appreciate my work and my voice, uh, I would say the same thing too, because it it does allow us to do this work. And if we can't, then religion automatically wins. So thank you. We got another super sticker. Woo! I appreciate it. Thank it's one of the in. ways that we combat bad religion in this world is by supporting causes that we want to see more. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the reality. Yep. Thank you, Brittany. Well said. Sometimes I'm just running on fumes of love and I'm like, the donations and the money will come. <laughs> I used to, I was like, if you want to maybe like give mm -hmm. me a quarter. And then when someone really challenged me on this, like you are like, we are not going to be able to change the world unless people realize that if, if all, if all of the money is just going to cults and religions, then, um, mm -hmm. then we already lose. Right. And mm -hmm. so once I saw it that way, I realized, no, this is actually an important part of this, that all of us, instead of giving 10% to causes that you don't believe in, spend that money on causes that you do. It really mm -hmm. does change the world. Mm -hmm. And it, bring it all back down to like experiences. There's a lot of content that I could make um, for like a wider audience of just like, here's why Mormons are just the stupidest people ever and <laughs> or whatever. And I'm like, that's not core to who I am. I want to be able to, you know, after the, the things don't add up and the things aren't true, the, the next answers of life and the nihilism and the questions of taking people out of that dark place, making them laugh, giving them some tools, taking them to Greece for seven days. Those are the things that I want to be doing for the rest of my life, just for the experience of it to do it. So thank you guys for this amazing conversation between Brittany and me and all of us here. And that I think wraps up the episode. All right. Appreciate you. Brittany. Much love for the me. Best. Thanks. Thanks love everybody guys. in the comments. Bye. Bye.